Perfect. Yeah, I'm ready to go. Great. Thank you. Can we promote Andrew? Can y'all hear me? Uh, yes, who was that? Emmanuel. Hey, Emmanuel, hi. I think figure it's easier if I'm, I'm on here. Yeah, that's cool. Who am I promoting? Uh, Andrew. Yes. Uh, Andrew. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. And then you can be panelists, panel, uh, attendees as they come in. So I should just let everyone in now as a panelist? Yeah. Okay. This is um, two screens open. YouTube feed I just started. Great. It's such a shame. I can't actually see everybody. Oh, because of the share. Do you have a second device you could pull up the um... I've got I've got two screens running already. <laughs> um, Paul, yeah. I don't know if this is a thing for you, but at the very top of the screen where it says you are sharing your screen, is there a view options menu or a menu there? Actually, I've got I've got a little window with thumbnails. So. Hey, look, everybody's coming okay, in the perfect. house. This is pretty cool. A few names I don't recognize, loads I do. Hey, Bonnie, great to see you. Deborah M, hi. i uh, got uh, Dita, Francisco, Karina, Jen. This is an international crowd tonight. I was going to say tonight, but it's kind of not tonight, is it, really? Yeah. Uh, uh, if anybody's joining already, uh, we haven't really started, so we're just kind of... The slew crowd are having a bit of a natter. Um, so there's Russ, look, smiling. It's past midnight there on the West Coast. Todd is uh, managing the show for us there. Uh, really important guy there. Uh, if, if, um, if these boxes are the same for everybody, did we ever establish that? Are the boxes... You I'm are pointing at them for me. I'm pointing at Andrew, the really yeah. important guy. He's looking after our feeds today. They're, they're different for everybody, so it's always okay. So I for... could be pointing to absolutely anybody there, and and if I pointed down there, that's not necessarily Russ down there. Or, or you Todd there. you were pointing to Todd though. He is important. So okay, uh, okay, cool. Yeah. He's, he's you, in the number it. one slot. You could probably point it as long as you don't say a name. You can just say this person is very important, and, oh, yes. and then. And then, you know, it could be anybody. Very important. <laughs> Most important person in, in, in the whole <laughs> event. That's Deborah for me. Uh, Milton's over there as well. Hey, Milton. <laughs> Morning. Oh, look, I've got, I've never seen that before. I've got two pages of thumbnails. I better hop over and see Francisco's uh, Yari's there. Uh, hi, Yari. Yari Backman. Oh, you probably enjoyed some of uh, Yari's superb um, images that he shares in the slew data. Uh, Melanie, Simon, uh, Thiago, Helen, Mike C, Roland, Simon O'Brien, Mother Paul, Keith, Jen, uh, Divya's here. Hello, Divya. Um, I think we've got some ambassadors in the house tonight, haven't we? So, uh, oh, where are we? Three minutes away. Melanie's down there as well. I've seen that. Mariana. Cool names, everybody. I'm just stuck with Paul. Ugh. What are my parents thinking? Uh, Russ has switched his video off. It's obviously too late. The bleary eyes have got to him. So, uh, so I, I don't know about you lot, but I'm in the UK. It is uh, nearly 6 a.m. here. As you can tell, the bags are baggier than normal. So, uh, but it's going to catch up with you lot in the United States. But in India, we've got loads and loads of viewers today from India because this thing is so well-timed for everybody over there. 
it's like a uh, late morning there about 10 30. you know that indian time zone i think it's the only time zone in the world that doesn't stick to on the hour so they're kind of half an hour in front now i do do excuse me my dog's been up with me all night as well so i expect he's probably going to start whining at some point for his breakfast this morning if he doesn't i probably will so Oh, we got a couple of minutes to go. Uh, can uh, just raise your hands if you can see a beautiful partial <laughs> eclipse sun. Yes, you can see it. It's on the screen. Great. That oh dear, dog's having a coughing fit. Uh, do excuse me. He's he's a, he's got a slew membership, so he is entitled to be on the Zoom webinar with everybody we've got a couple of minutes left until we kind of go live every good because this is being broadcast everywhere else as well tonight you know this is a, a slew star party for members but uh, we're out on uh, facebook and twitter and stuff like that as well i think so how are we doing for a countdown my audio okay stuff like that sharing loads of stuff today yeah thank you carol hi carol uh it must be uh 7 a.m in the morning carol over there or bit later yes it's, a, it's actually a very uh, good time for me this morning i've just woken up had breakfast it Excellent. feels like fun it's going to be a wonderful and fun day i can't wait for this it is it's going to be a good one so uh, we are nearly uh looking at the clock ticking over is it gonna go is it gonna go let's go My dog is now upside down having a mad fit as long as he doesn't pull a cable out we are gonna be fine so I reckon, there we go, we should get underway. So welcome slewers uh, to our lifestyle party. Uh, please mute your microphones unless you're uh, talking to us, asking a question or anything like that. But anyway, listen, welcome slewers to our live star party to celebrate what I think is actually uh, my second favorite eclipse, a spectacular ring of fire annular solar eclipse. Ring of fire annular kind of mean the same thing. I'll probably use a mix of both, depending on what the uh, what brain cells are working. But what we can see here up on the screen at the moment is our live feed, our first live feed. We've got quite a few coming in today. Uh, this is from our partners. I want to give a special shout out to uh, Mashor Ahmed Al Wadat. Uh, he's a professor of astrophysics at uh, the Sharjah Academy for Astronomy, Space Science and Technology. SAS, uh, that's at the University of Sharjah, terrific feed here. And as we can see, uh, we've already got a huge chunk of the sun taken out by the moon in this glorious feed. They are in Sharjah, that's in the Middle East, United Arab Emirates, uh, where SLU are going to have a new observatory. Uh, obviously the, uh, the situation this year has somewhat delayed that, uh, but uh, we've got some, some plans afoot for all of that. Uh, now, um, so we've got some great live feeds coming up. We've, we've got our main feed, which is actually coming from India, because we're not gonna see a ring of fire in this particular feed, because they're outside of something called the path of annularity. And I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that uh, in a sec. Because I think what we can do today, is gonna be very relaxed, we're gonna be around for quite a time. So we've got lots of opportunity for question for you lot, Hello, everybody. Hey, look, there's so many people here today. I can't believe it. Um, so loads of opportunities for questions and stuff like that. But we'll look at all the live feeds. And we are also going to introduce uh, our new Eclipse uh, quest, which is our first what's called a moment quest, which is to celebrate a specific event. So only those people who are kind of watching now and snapping images. So go over to the, uh, the show page and snap images. You're going to be the only people who can finish this quest because if people are not snapping the images they won't have the images to do this but uh anyway what else we got i have got one little thing uh we got to uh, russ glenn is uh, here he's going to be joining us later because if you've got any kids students or grandkids or if you know any children basically uh you need to listen to russ a little bit later because he's got full details about online space camp which we're running all summer. So we'll hop over to Russ, probably in about 20 minutes time, something like that. But before we remind ourselves of what this annual eclipse is, what's causing it, uh, got some great stuff about 
three types of shadow that the moon casts, because that's what we're looking at at the moment. So the moon is casting a shadow. The earth is going into uh, the moon's shadow, which is really cool. But did you know there are three types of shadow? Well, we're going to look at those. Uh, but I had an email from somebody in India who is going to be able to see this. Uh, they're outside of the path of annularity, so they won't see the annual eclipse. They'll see a partial eclipse like this. And they were asking me, how do we watch this safely? And of course, I, my obvious answer is safely on your screens uh, with our live feeds. But if you are anywhere where the eclipse is visible, which is basically a chunk of Africa, Middle East, uh, India, China, and then you've got the Far East, we've got a feed coming in from um, Sharon Ahmed uh, in Malaysia a little bit later on. Um, if you are in one of those zones where you can see this, there are some safety tips for watching an eclipse. And the first one is you never look at the sun directly unless you've got proper eclipse glasses. Some people use welding glass and stuff like that. I like to stick to a proper pair of eclipse glasses. All of the feeds that we've got today are using very, very special filters um, over the telescopes. So definitely don't look through any optical aids like binoculars or telescopes or anything like that. Um, so protect your eyes. Now, if you have got a pair of eclipse glasses, hopefully they're new, but even if they are new, you need to do a test. You need to go up to an old fashioned incandescent light bulb. Can you remember those? There's people watching out there who haven't got a clue on incandescent light bulb. It's, it's an old fashioned light bulb with a little filament in it. Hold your eclipse glasses up to that light bulb, bright light bulb, and you're checking for little pinpricks of light. And if you see one of those, throw the glasses away. Even the smallest scratch or smallest pinprick in those glasses will let enough light through to damage your eyesight for good. So please be careful out there. Um, uh, 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 Gangsha is here. Hi, Gangsha. She's SLU, um, SLU uh, ambassador. So Carol's here, Milton's here still. Hi, Jenny. Um, Satya, hello. Yari's here again. Stan, hey Stan. Stan's looking nice, relaxed there. Hey, uh, Bob, uh, I, I want to know a little bit later. Uh, we're going to look at the eclipse now and kind of the, this whole event. But I want to hear a little bit later. So be prepared where you're all from. All right. We kind of do a little roll call for anybody who's interested. Uh, but uh, anyway, listen, let's um, let's have a, a, a little think about. Uh, actually, I know what I'm going to do. I know what I'm going to do. Can I can I very quickly share the, the quest with you? Because mm -hmm. I've only just made it live and I haven't actually checked to see if it's available yet. So here's the SLU website. Uh, hopefully you can all see that. Can you see the SLU website? Thumbs up, thumbs down. Yay, thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, thanks, Ross. Uh, right, so we go to quests down here. I bet there are going to be loads of shared observations um, of the, uh, the eclipse later on. So here we go, Ring of Fire, solar eclipse 2020. And we've got a total solar eclipse coming up uh, later in the year. Uh, so here is um, our quest and hopefully you are all snapping images because what we've uh, what we've got here is one heck of a good poster uh, for you to fill out right this is going to be your poster then all the slots we'll go into how you can do this because we've got some really really cool stuff with how we've done this um, and here are all your image slots that you can fill in we've got 41 image slots so that's what you're going to try and grab today all right, I'm just going to go over though, remind people uh, where we can snap these images. So over the shows page, you need to join the show. And there it is. I need to mute that because I'm going to, that's interesting. I don't actually see what the rest of you are seeing the way we do these shows now. It's odd. Uh, anyway, I'm going to pause that because I don't want that. But here we go. Uh, so let's hop over to the SCAS feed. And there it is. So this is what you need to be snapping, right? Now, you cannot snap too many images of this entire event because what you're going to be able to do is uh, build that. In fact, uh, Andrew, just uh, just do a check, make sure that that is updating if you could because that looks a little bit out of step uh, with the live stream that we were seeing. So worth a little check on that. So anyway, come back here. Uh, India is going to be the feed. Uh, it's not up yet, uh, but it's going to be the feed that we see annularity, the ring of fire in. So you need to keep a little bit of a close eye on that. Andrew will 
let us know. He'll alert us later when that one comes online. Uh, so let's have a look at that. I'm just going to snap another one just to go. Oh, that's the slew test card. Uh, EAC isn't up and running yet. So that's EAC in the Middle East, by the way. That's another one of our feed partners. But anyway, uh, let's hop back to the quest because we've got some cool information in the quest, which will be a nice little kind of aid memoir. Getting hot here in the morning, so let's switch the fan on. So. <laughs> okay, so I've got a couple of nice diagrams in here. So, so I think the first thing to do is, um, is to maybe ask ourselves, when do we see an annular eclipse? Now, if you've got any questions about this after I've gone through it, then let me know and we'll do a kind of Q&A on it if you like. But there are three phenomena that have to occur um, around the same time to create an annular solar eclipse. There's the new moon, there's what's called the moon at apogee, and there are things called the lunar nodes. Now, the new moon, this actually is the only time that we ever get to see a truly new moon. So what you're looking at in that silhouette is the new moon. Not quite, actually, because it's when it's kind of central across, that's the actual moment. But the new moon occurs when the moon and the sun have got what's called the same ecliptic longitude. Um, and it's only visible uh, during uh, solar eclipses when we, when we see the new moon uh, as, a, as a silhouette basically in front of the moon. Now, this is a great time uh, this week uh, to start the Lunar Phases quest, if you haven't already done that, uh, because we've set up special missions on Tuesday evening uh, using the Canary 2 Ultra Wide Field Telescope to capture an incredibly thin, young, uh, waxing crescent moon. So make sure you check that out. So new moon is the first phenomena. So we know it's new moon today. The moon has to be at apogee. Now, as you'll probably remember from our recent uh, supermoon star parties, the moon has an elliptical orbit, it's not circular. Now that means that the moon's distance from Earth changes as it orbits the Earth. And when the moon is closest to Earth, it's called perigee. Uh, and that's when we get a supermoon, when it's large. Um, and if it coincides, actually, it, it, it's not necessarily um, just when it's closest, but it has to be a new moon or a full moon for it to be considered uh, a supermoon. When the moon is furthest away from Earth in that elliptical orbit, it's called apogee, uh, and the moon appears smaller. Now, if that coincides with a new or full moon, it's called a micro or mini moon. Um, now, we know that the moon and the sun have uh, this extraordinary, I think it's one of the, the best cosmic coincidences ever. Um, we, we know that they have extremely similar apparent sizes so how big they look in sky in fact let me just i'm just going to hop over actually to uh, the live feed a sec because that that look a, a bit nice won't it? Uh, while we're talking about this oh look at this they must be uh, near greatest eclipse andrew maybe you could uh, look up to see uh, when they are going to be at greatest eclipse so that we know uh, you know uh, when that's going to be uh, maximum obscurity but anyway so we know that the sun and moon by this extraordinary cosmic coincidence uh, are very, very similar sizes, the size they appear in the sky. That's how big they are, right? The that fact combined with uh, knowing the moon's apparent size varies, which we know in its elliptical orbit, is important when it comes to the type of solar eclipses we see. Now we're gonna talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but the third event or phenomena that has to happen tonight uh, to cause an annual eclipse, we know the moon not only has that elliptical orbit, but it's also tilted at around six degrees. About six degrees, anybody correct me if I'm wrong, it's five or six degrees, isn't it? Uh, now, there are two points, and those are called these lunar nodes in the moon's orbit, where that orbit, the path of the moon, intersects with what's called the ecliptic. Now, the ecliptic is the plane of the Earth's orbit around the sun. It's basically the path the sun takes through our sky uh, over the course of a year. Now, if at new moon, the moon isn't close to one of those lunar nodes, uh, from our perspective anyway, 
the moon is either above or below the sun. So we don't see an eclipse. That's why we don't see an eclipse every single solar cycle, every, every lunar month. Uh, but if the new moon is close to one of those lunar nodes, that's when it passes directly between us, Earth, and the sun, just as we're seeing in our live feed here. Um, so that's kind of the three phenomena that have to come together. And it's one of the reasons why this is actually quite a rare kind of eclipse, these annular ring of fire um, eclipses. Now, I think it's worthwhile, actually. Um, should we go back to that diagram? So, Andrew, uh, give me a thumbs up if, uh, if camera's running OK on, on this feed. Updating OK? Yeah, that's good. Jolly good. So he's snapping away, snapping away. In fact, I've just realized something. Because I'm kind of doing the show, I'm not going to be able to snap all the images, am I? That's, that sucks. <laughs> OK. Um, right, listen. Um, we'll, we'll go to some questions in a, in a sec. But I wanted to tell you about these three, um, in fact, let's bring it up on the poster. These three special, uh, this is adapted by Andrew. Uh, Lovely, uh, lovely diagram. Is this is actually on your finished poster as well. This kind of little infographic that's on the finished poster. So there are these three shadows that are cast by the moon. Um, so let's start from the beginning. Uh, we know a solar eclipse occurs when the Earth passes into the moon's shadow. But there are these three. And depending on which one is actually in contact with the Earth's surface, makes a big difference as to what kind of eclipse we see. Now, the first one, the first shadow, you, you'll, you'll maybe uh, recognize some of these from lunar eclipses. So we've got the umbral shadow. Now, the umbral shadow is the moon's dark inner shadow, and it's represented by that black dot, that dense, dark black spot just off the west coast of Africa there. Now, um, if it touches the Earth and you're within it, you'll see a total solar eclipse uh, when the moon totally obscures the sun. The path of the umbral shadow um, as it races across uh, Earth's surface is called the path of totality. So that's the black dot there. But then we've got the penumbra, and I've got another diagram that I'll show you in a minute, which kind of makes more sense of this. And you can see that's a, this huge, and it's thousands of miles across, in diameter, this huge lighter shadow. Um, and that's the outer shadow, and it's called the penumbral shadow. Now, if you're within that, you'll witness a partial solar eclipse. So if we hop back really quickly to that live feed from Sharjah in the Middle East, they are currently in the umbral shadow. Now, even places, uh, let's hop back to the old map because it's a lovely diagram. Even places which are going to be in the next shadow that we talk about, or let's say for total solar eclipse in that path of totality, have a period of partial eclipse first, because that's what we see. We see it slowly cover, slowly cover um, the, the sun until you get your moment. And it can be anything from seconds. If you remember, I traveled all the way to uh, the middle of Africa a few years ago for 13 seconds of totality. But it can also be uh, a couple of minutes long as well. Um, but let's go to the third shadow and you can see it's marked there. So you can see that the umbral shadow, that dark one, uh, is cone shaped. But it also extends and when it extends past its point that's when uh, we hit our third type of shadow and this is what we're seeing today. This is the ant umbral shadow and this is uh, this lighter shadow that extends beyond that cone-shaped dark umbral shadow. Um, and this is when you see an annular eclipse. And it's because the moon is further away um, from Earth, so it's not big enough to cover the entire sun. And that's when we see uh, that ring of fire. And if you're in that path of the ant umbral shadow, which is really quite narrow, this path, uh, it does vary over the course of uh, when it travels across the, the Earth's surface. If you're within that, it's, it's called the path of annularity and you see an annular eclipse. So 
let's have a quick look because we've got another couple of diagrams actually and then we'll, we'll go to a couple of questions we've got um so here we go this is this is today's eclipse so this is the map um from today's eclipse and what you can see here is that's where the shadow touched down uh in the center of africa uh, about uh two hours ago now and the red line here is the path of annularity. So if you are within that very narrow path, maybe 70 miles wide, something like that, you will see an annular eclipse. When you get to the edge of that path, the moon will be uh, totally, not totally centered. Let me put it this way. If you're in the center of the path of annularity, the moon will be perfectly centered in the ring of fire. If you're off to one side in the path of annularity, then the moon is offset to one side, but you'll still get a ring but it won't be a, a perfect ring. If you're outside of that, in all of that blue gridded area, that's where you're going to experience um, a partial solar eclipse. So you can see Middle East is down here. This is where the feeds are. They're incredibly close. So it's actually gonna be quite a, a deep partial eclipse. They're gonna get quite a lot um, of the sun obscured. Um, and that's what we call the magnitude um, of uh, an eclipse is how much of the sun is covered. But there's also this uh, lovely little thing here. So here we can see India. Hello, India. I know there's loads of people watching uh, from India today because it's uh, about what, uh, about 11, coming up to 11 a.m., uh, I guess, over there in India. Give us a thumbs up if anybody's from India. Um, about 11. So this is perfectly timed for them because the sun is getting very, very close to overhead. And this is where, uh, on the globe, they're going to see the greatest eclipse. Um, so that's, that's quite a cool place to be at the moment. And we've got our feed uh, coming up a little bit later. But you can also see here, we've got some feeds coming from Malaysia um, a little bit later. They're gonna see a very partial uh, solar eclipse. So this 0 0.20, what we're seeing down there, they're gonna see 20% of the sun. If you're on that line, you're gonna see 20% of the sun uh, covered uh, by the moon. Oh, by the way, when I'm giving these explanations about this, um, I, I, it's, it's not unusual for me to confuse the Earth, Sun and Moon, but hopefully you know what I'm talking about. Um, anyway, listen, uh, here is um, a great little animation from NASA, um, and this is of today's Ring of Fire eclipse. Now, if you look really carefully on this, you can actually see the little black dot. It'll start again in a sec. There you go. There's the, uh, there's the partial. That's the uh, penumbral shadow, the big gray one, but you can just see that tiny little dot. And that's the ant umbral shadow, this tiny, tiny little shadow about 70 miles in diameter. And it crosses, crosses the Earth's surface. So that's where you want to be. But look, we're just in darkness. So the Canary Islands just missed this um, at the Canary Islands Observatory here in the UK. We just missed it. I looked up on a star chart because I was, let's go, let's hop back to the live feed. Are you all snapping images, by the way? Give us a thumbs up, because if you're not, you're not going to be able to do that poster, and you'll be very upset because it's a one-off. Um, oh, look at that. Oh. Andrew, did, did you check, see when they're at um, maximum? Do you know what time? Can Andrew hear me? Andrew's concentrating on the feeds. Hello. Oh, no, he can hear me. You can see. You can see. He smiled. Anybody got the uh, time Hi, or maximum? Oh, he's there. Andrew, did you manage to check? The timings. Yeah, what, when, when are they at maximum? Okay, so totality starts at 04.47, maximum at 06.40, uh, total end at 8.32, these are all UTC, and it ends at 9.34. So 0640 is an hour and 20 minutes before they're going to be at maximum. That seems like a long time to me, given just how much of, um, just given how much of the sun is already obscured. So that's gonna be an interesting one to keep an eye on, but look at that. That is so appropriate, isn't it? For one of our Middle East feeds. It's not a crescent moon, but it's a crescent sun. Look at that. That is, uh, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, but. Talk amongst yourselves for a second, um, because I need to just do something here. I've, I've got to get a snap of that myself. That is such a good shot. So, oh, oh. so I'm going over to the shows page. I'm going over to. Uh, I'm going to mute that, stop that, because I don't want that playing. 
I'm going to hop over to that feed. Oh, look at that. Oh, look how much it's moved. Oh, look at that. Right now, that is going to be available now in my poster. Uh, do you want to have a quick look at the quest? Thumbs up, thumbs down before we get uh, Russ on to talk about online space camp. Quick. Yeah. OK. Oh, Russ, even Russ is saying it. Russ has obviously got a cup of coffee. So he's saying, yeah, yeah, leave me for five minutes. Take a look at the quest. That'll keep me busy. Right. Let's have a look. Uh, you can also get to your quests if they're underway. Uh, by pressing the top right hand down on my quest and we'll see two tabs in this particular view. Uh, sorry, it might take a little bit of time because my machine's doing lots of stuff at the moment. So, uh, uh, by the way, if you're watching uh, on the old interweb, in the old interweb land, then uh, hop over to SLU, join the community. Uh, you can join us lot because we have fun. We control those telescopes. I know what I meant to do, Andrew, at the beginning of this. The Canary Islands were still online when we started the show. I think it had about five minutes left. I was gonna show the first, the last missions of the night. Never mind. there's always tomorrow night, isn't there, Whistler? Right, here is the quest, um, but um, let's, let's scroll down. Now, everything I've just told you about there, uh, if you wanna recap, if, if you want it without my 6 a.m. stuttering, um, you, can, you can read it all here, folks. So there's a good reminder, you can rewatch the show here we haven't even watched it first time yet, have we? But you can rewatch it there. Um, so there's a recap. Tells you what an annual eclipse is. You know, all the normal stuff in the quest. Um, but no questions. It's no questions in a quest, good or bad. Mm, I don't know. I don't think Carol will like it. Carol likes to stretch the gray, the gray brain cells. Right. This is the next step. Step two is the one that uh, we want to have a real good look at today. And um, we'll do it after us. We'll take a good look um, after us. But... Uh, here we've got our poster. Now, this is just a dummy poster, all right? So we've got 41 image slots. Now, you can capture more than 41 uh, images in all of our feeds today and put them in your poster. Uh, and you can put any image in any slot, um, which is quite good because I've got something to show you. I'll, I'll show you a little bit later. I think it's really cool. I, Andrew and I came up with this idea. It's, it's just good. So that was a test image I used earlier. But look, there is my image. So this is a special object in the SLU 1000 object. So it just comes up as that. Now, slot 41, the one I've just chosen, is a special slot. We'll see in a sec. So while we're waiting for the circle, oh, I thought I had time for a slurp of coffee then, but it's very unprofessional, but I'm amongst friends. So there we go. Um, so 41 is that middle slot. Uh, so, hey, Paul. Paul's just been joined on the sofa um, by his partner. Uh, right, I'm going to hop over now. Uh, the important one. Um, do not claim your badge on a quest until you know you never, ever, ever want to make any changes to it. Because as soon as you claim your badge, the quest is locked. You can't change which images. You can't change your questions. You can't change anything about it. So big, uh, big, uh, big tip there. There, look at that. Isn't that a cool poster? I like it. But I got some really cool things, right, to show you because imagine all of these slots. You don't have to use all of the slots. Now, some of you are already, I bet Yari is already thinking, oh, I know what I can do with that. You can just place some images in different slots. You can go along the rows, so you can do it kind of chronologically. You, how about a spiral? go along, down, round, as the eclipse progresses. Uh, or you could just use kind of the center of each one and form a circle of images. And I'll show you how you can then edit that afterwards to make this poster absolutely the bee's knees. But while I flick back, uh, we, we'll go into that a little bit more. Let's have a quick look at that feed. Um, so I'm just gonna tell you, actually give you a quick update before we get Russ on. Um, so this is from our partners, uh, the, uh, I always have to read this because they, they changed. It used to be just SCAS, and then they added a couple of words. So it's now S-A-A-S-S-T, -S -S which is not easy to say, and you can't kind of say SAS. Maybe we should have a poll. Maybe we should have a Zoom poll, how you pronounce that. But anyway, it's the Sharjah Academy for Astronomy, Space Science, and Technology at the University of Sharjah. And they never let us down uh, with a good eclipse feed. And what we can see here, I... I wonder, I, I'm going to look up, while, while Russ is telling us about online space camp, I'm going to take another look to see just how much 
of, uh, of the sun is going to disappear. They're not going to see annular, but they are seeing a very deep partial eclipse from what you can see there. But uh, we've got feeds coming up from Sursa in India. That's going to be, that is in the path of annularity. That's going to be a good one. Uh, we've, got, can... uh, we've got another feed. Um, just uh, Helen, could you, could you mute yourself, please? Um, thank you very much. Um, we've got an, another feed uh, from Abu Dhabi. Now that is online. I uh, will show you that um, after Russ has finished. Um, what else we got? We've got a, another feed coming in from Malaysia and the Dubai Astronomy Group. Um, Andrew, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll send you the, uh, the URL for that because I'm not sure you've got that. But anyway, listen, that's enough for me for a moment because we are going to hear, don't forget, if you know of any children anywhere in the world who like a bit of space, like a bit of technology, stuff like that. Excuse dog licking noises. Excuse me, mate. Don't do that in company. Um, <laughs> if you know any children anywhere in the world, you need to listen to Russ because Russ is our director of education and he is going to tell us about the online space camp. Russ, first of all, am I too old to join the online space camp for summer? Uh, I'm sorry, Paul. Yes, you are too old for space camp. So. Uh, we, we have had many, many people uh, offering to uh, be the chef, I think, at Space Camp. But uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, you're, 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 a little, you're a little bit old. But um, if you do well, know thanks, any, <laughs> any students, you know, we're, 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 uh, we can handle any students. And I think it's interesting for any kids to join up, um, elementary, middle, high school. Um, you know, we're, we're getting together and we're having... Uh, star parties kind of like what we're doing tonight. Um, we're getting together. We're looking at the telescope feeds. We're capturing images. We are uh, every week has a featured quest that we dig into. So, um, you know, we, we spent earlier uh, this month in the spring, fall Celestials Gems quest, collecting images, talking about the objects that we're seeing, fielding questions. The kids have lots of questions. And then, um, uh, yeah, we've got so, we've got some space campers on uh, on this feed tonight. So, big shout out to you, uh, Kevin. I know Kevin's on tonight. It might be some other folks too. But uh, you know, we we're having a great time. And uh, you know, even if the telescopes are not functional, we are we are doing some some great interesting stuff. I'm playing some songs. We're reading some stories. We're uh, you know, looking at the uh, at the different constellations, and we're learning about the the different myths associated with them. Not only the Greek myths, but also myths from uh, American Indians and from uh, other uh, cultures around the world. So, you know, doing all kinds of, of fun stuff here in the online space camp, and it's really just the I think it's just the tip of the iceberg for what we're doing uh, with education here at SLU. And I, and you know, the community I think knows this. I think everyone. Been, is benefiting from the educational opportunities here at SLU. The quests are available to everybody. Um, so we have students that are digging into it. Um, we also have a, a, a partnership that we've recently formed with the International Planetarium Society. So we have a lot of planetariums that are jumping in with us as well and um, starting their own astronomy clubs. And those clubs are, uh, you know, they're, they're, doing outreach for their members using the SLU telescopes and using the SLU shows. Um, so really able to touch a lot of people's lives uh, this summer. And, um, you know, I just want to call out a couple of the, the planetariums that we're partnering with. You know, we got the, the Fleischmann Planetarium, which is out in Reno, Nevada. And um, they've been doing some great stuff with their club. Um, We've got the Thomas Planetarium in Anchorage, Alaska. They've just recently joined with us and they're gonna be using us for their summer camp as well. So, you know, SLU has our online space camp, but other people are also getting subscriptions for the young people and allowing them to also uh, participate on their, on their own camps. And so it's, it's really exciting, I think, to see all the things that are, that are going on. Uh, the Students' Corner Club is, we're almost at 900 members in the Students Corner Club, so we're, you know, I imagine in the wow. next few weeks we'll be at a thousand, which will be astounding and so much fun to have so many students uh, posting there, posting their first pictures, posting their hundredth pictures, uh, discuss, uh, posting in the discussion section, and of course coming to our online space camp. So the online space camp is hosted through the Students Corner, so. 
when you join SLU as a student, you are put into the Students' Corner Club and all the information for the space camp is found in that club. So please make sure once you join SLU, uh, you go to that club and take a look. All the information is gonna be there. I'm also posting some activities you can do at home. So, you know, uh, we've, we've had students who have um, been looking, using themselves as a sundial and then tracing that outline with sidewalk chalk. We've had students, uh, I sent home uh, an, an activity for them to make some rockets using effervescent tablets. So, um, you know, lots of fun things that we're doing that take place on SLU using our telescopes, um, and, but also things they can do during the day uh, that keeps, keeps them occupied as well. One other thing that we are doing that I think is really fantastic, and I would encourage uh, any of you who are, who are educators out there or no educators, we also have uh, some free professional development about how you can use SLU in your classroom. Uh, SLU is an incredibly powerful tool for learning astronomy, uh, but also for lear learning the scientific process. So um, if you want to get an idea a little bit more about that, um, you can reach out to me at russ at slu.com and I'm happy to uh, plug you in with our professional development for this summer. Um, you know, we've got SLU in classrooms, but we've also got SLU at the college level. So college labs are, um, are using us this summer um, for their observation-based labs. And uh, we're gonna be seeing more and more of that in the fall. So, a lot of exciting things uh, going on at the educational uh, part of SLU, um, which really is all of SLU. I mean, we're just we're just uh, a part of this amazing uh, interface that we have. Russ, what was the uh, what's the most popular quest that students in space camp are, are doing? Do you think have you had much feedback? Well, so uh, I mean, they're all jumping in with our starter quests, which is really great. great. It's, a, it's a good Cosmic place for them Explorer. to do. That's a good place to start, Cosmic Explorer. Cosmic Explorer is, is good. Um, I think they're, you know, we're, uh, the students have really been enjoying, you know, we really enjoyed the spring, fall Celestial Gems quest. That was, Ooh, that yeah. was really great. Um, and then we, we launched into the Messier quest, Messier Ooh, challenge, big one. big one. Yeah, collection. Um, you know, this this last week we did have uh, you know a couple of days without uh, where the weather did not cooperate. Yeah. So, um, but you know, um, one of the wonderful things I think about the camp is it gives kids the opportunity to really learn how to optimize their time with SLU. So, um, and that's su super valuable for them. They're often running. They're all doing their own things. You know, uh, on the days we're not having camp. So, um, nice. yeah, those are the popular ones. I'll tell you the most popular thing I think uh, is the we've been reading the 12 labors of Hercules because we were looking at the Hercules cluster and um, the kids love the 12 labors of Hercules. They always want to hear the next labor. So um, we have not made our way through it entirely, but we are working our way through it over camp. So we're having some fun. We're doing all kinds of things. Um, you know, it's, it's just been a blast. So I you, think the kids are having to, a good time uh, and me too. Have you, have you got anything lined up? Because uh, we're obviously, this is an eclipse. So we know it's new moon today. Uh, the new moon is too close to the sun. Uh, hey, look, listen, that's the first ring of fire we've got down in the bottom right hand side for mana. Uh, wow, that is pretty cool. This is, uh, by the way, Alfie, sorry to, uh, to digress there, but I just spotted that. This is our partners down in... Uh, the Middle East, once again, in Dubai, the Dubai Astronomy Group have been working with these guys for years, and loads of their members have been piling in, getting feeds together. And you can just see there, they are losing annularity. So that was a very, very short um, period of annularity that that passed over. And let's keep a little bit of an eye on some of these because the, the path actually, when it goes through the Middle East, the path of annularity, uh, when that ant umbral, if you remember, shadow is is crossing the Middle East, um, is very narrow and it's it doesn't go through very many major cities or towns. And of course, so many places in lockdown, so many people were preparing to travel off to get into the path of annularity, but nobody can travel. Here we go, annularity, top left. That's pretty cool. Um, now we haven't got these as individual feeds, 
uh, the DAG have kind of pulled these together for us, but that looked like you hopefully seeing that. Um, that looks like that's over. It's, it, they are so, they're obviously a long way away from the, from the center. Um, and the, and the annular phase when you're further away from what's called greatest eclipse is you know not not that long as we're seeing i mean look at that man of um feed down in the bottom right hand side that's already well outside um of annular so are we going to get any of those others i i'm, I'm afraid uh, they didn't tell me the location of these um before we started the star party tonight because we could have looked up to see um when they were going to hit the annular phase but look at that you never see you know such a thin crescent sun as that that's pretty cool um russ i was uh, going back to sorry what i was saying there before we were treated to our first glimpse of annularity ring of fire um was new moon there we see it new moon a true new moon in front of the sun it's too close to the sun to view with the nighttime telescopes over the coming nights. But on Tuesday, we've set up these special missions when the moon is really, really low. So members can't schedule the telescopes when the moon is so low. So we have to set up these special ones. So if students watch those live missions and snap images, it's a fabulous way of starting the lunar phase quest to get a really, really thin crescent moon so uh, uh, when is your next session is it monday tuesday uh we're, our next session in is actually the first week of july so oh, um right. we're all though interacting through the students corner club so um i'll be sending out some posts to remind them let them know what to go look at um right. i also encourage the, the students to go and, and use the slu um solar telescope i mean that's such a powerful mm opportunity for them to take a look at our own sun which you know it's the you know it's the thing that provides life for i mean provides all the energy for life on earth so it, you know we got to give it some love i, I want to get those kids taking pictures of it every day looking for changes in the features so um you know, that's one right. thing i've encouraged them to do but uh, i'll definitely be posting a, uh, about the uh, the lunar the good time to start a, the lunar quest so. lunar the lunar phase quest and yeah. it sounds like i ought to get um Get my act into gear and get you the solar features quest done as well published too because we, we have been treated to some absolutely astounding solar features some of the prominences that we've seen just over this last week then we had last week that huge active area active region and we watched it over days in fact we, we'll hop over maybe to uh observations because a few people have shared that i think cameron shared it as it was going across the sun. But anyway, Russ, you're gonna come back a bit later. Uh, you're gonna gonna tell us, um, well, you're not going anywhere, but I'm you're gonna kind of open your microphone up and tell us a little bit more about online space camp a bit later. And and I do I think, think you we should- might, We might do a little reading. I mean, I've got some some okay. some good reading material, some, some stuff, so who knows what we're gonna do later. So we'll see. Okay, uh, and do consider raising the uh, age limit on online space camp. <laughs> Cheers, I, Russ. I, I've gotten a lot of emails about that. So uh, you know, maybe maybe we need to look at like a senior camp or something. I don't know. Hey, good I Oh, <laughs> I've just realized that you're classing me as a senior. No, Thanks, I, mate. It, it, time, I mean... no time for you to go, Russ. Time for you to go. No, switch your microphone. You're welcome. Yeah. Maybe see you later. Someone kick him out, will you? <laughs> that was Russ Glenn. I, I'll be very happy when they, if they, you come out with a senior camp. Nice one, Bonnie. I'm with you there, mate. Uh, I, I think there's a few of us here that would kind of like an organized. This is this is a good idea, isn't it? We'll call you know, it. Well, it's Elder Hostel. We'll call it Elder Hostel. Eld oh, I mean, it's, it changes good. everything, right? It changes well, everything. Elder sounds like you, you're just full of wisdom and yeah, learning. Exactly. Exactly. I like that. Elder. Yeah. No, I like the idea. And but uh, genuinely, I think that would be a really cool thing to do is kind of some organized progression that we can hop through some of the quests together be a good reason for a star party who needs a reason for a star party to get together with all the slew members around the world but uh, sounds pretty good to me anybody up for that 
Thumbs up with uh, Stan. Yeah, yeah, Gretchen. Hey, Gretchen. Uh, Satya Earth. Yes, Carol's always up for it. So thank you very much. So now a few of you not. So, oh, yeah, down there. Oh, so, sorry. Um, can't see some of the names, but uh, yeah. Oh, look, we got four pages of SLU members. Do, this has to be the biggest star party ever. Wow. Cool. I think we got some. Um, yeah, I just saw Divya's there. We got some carols here. Andrew is a SLU ambassador as well. By the way, if anybody's interested in learning more about the SLU ambassador program, then uh, email Divya at slu.com. Divya is D-I-V-Y-A. And uh, she leads the SLU ambassador program at SLU. Uh, it's, it's pretty cool. Uh, Carol's one, Andrew's one. Um, I'm sorry, I don't, I, I don't know if anybody else is here. I can't see anybody. I've got so many screens in front of me. But here we go. Look, we're still on the Dubai uh, Astronomy Group uh, in, uh, I think they are, they look like they were from a number of places. But listen, just while Russ was starting, um, when I was pretending to listen to him, but wasn't actually, um, I just looked up the, so our main feed um, that we had from Sharjah, they're actually going to get 86.5%. So 86% of the sun's surface um, is going to be obscured. And actually, we need to hop back to that because that happened five minutes ago. So that was, right, um, let's just hop back over. Um, it's not that one. Do excuse me, we're juggling a bit today. So what what we've, oh, no, it's not that one either. Let's pause that. There we go. So that that is just about 85% of the sun covered, which is pretty cool. So what we saw there was that we switched to the Dubai Astronomy Group just at the right time, because uh, let me just show you, actually, I'll show you another, I'll show you the map that I'm actually looking at for this. Um, so here we go. This is this nice little intelligent map. So here we've got the Earth. And we can see this path of annularity. So if you are in that path, you're going to see an annular eclipse. If you're outside of it in the green zone, you'll see a partial solar eclipse. Um, and what you can do with this map is you can zoom in. And I just popped a little pin there. And you can pop a pin anywhere. So if we popped a pin in the path, uh, we can see it's telling us, yes, there's going to be an annual eclipse. That's what you're going to see. The duration of it is 46 seconds. Um, obscuration, 98%. Of course, on an annual eclipse, it never reaches 100% um, because we've still got that ring of fire. But what we saw there is the that we said at the beginning um, of this show. Let's go full screen. That's cool. Isn't it? Um, this... The Ant Umbra shadow, so this this lighter shadow, um, touched touch down over here in Africa, and it races across the surface um, at tremendous speed. I think I think actually it can go thousands, no hundreds, hundreds, certainly hundreds of miles an hour. Maybe maybe somebody can can look up, do a bit of googling or something. Um, and look up uh, the speed that the path of totality and path of annularity, in other words, the speed of that shadow, because it's only a dot, we're seeing a path here, but that's the path it takes over maybe three hours. Um, so it's whizzing across. So what we saw there, when we were looking at those feeds, they were all reaching their peak um, of, of how much the sun was going to be askewed. If they were inside the path and they saw the annular, if they're outside of it, uh, like our uh, Sharjah feed, then they're seeing a partial. And up here, it was telling us 86%, and that's where I was getting the time from. Now, that shadow is now racing across. I think that's still the, no, that's going to be the Gulf, isn't it? Indian Ocean. Um, 
I don't know where the Arabian and Gulf and Indian Ocean actually meet up. But it's then going to hop across Pakistan, very few feeds coming out of uh, Pakistan. But then we have got um, our number one feed, and we're hoping that uh, AJ Talwar uh, is going to be in Sursa. And if I can just find Sursa for you, it's right up here. I think I've got to zoom in a bit more. Uh, and you can see actually that the greatest eclipse um, is occurring just on uh, the border um, of uh, India, um, and it occurs in the Nandu Devi National Park. Now, if you're having a sense of deja vu, the last annual eclipse was incredibly similar to this. It had an incredibly similar path. Um, I'm just trying to find Sursa. I think it's a smaller place. I don't know if anybody can see it, shout. I think it's somewhere. It's somewhere close up here. All right, Sursa. Uh, I can't actually see. See it. Uh, but this is the rough time where, uh, so what we've got here is Eclipse has already started. So the partial has six, yeah. The partial um, is already underway for them. So we will uh, maybe ask Andrew to check to see if their feed is up and running yet. Um, and then at 0638 or roughly, um, so about another three quarters of an hour, no, about an hour. In about an hour's time, that's when we should be seeing annula. So Andrew, if you are um, there, um, I don't know if you can tell me whether or not they um, have got their feed up and running yet. Uh, do excuse me, just rearranging some things on the screen. Uh, Is this India, Paul? Yeah. Yeah, it still says waiting for AJ, so it's not uh, not okay. live. Okay, so let's swap to his URL. No, 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 he wouldn't do that on us, surely. Uh, no, no one's ever done that to us in the past, have they? <laughs> mm, yeah, okay. Uh, I will just check my email. Uh, now, listen, while I'm just checking that, folks, uh, any questions so far? Oh, hold on a sec. I've got uh, an email from... <gasps> oh, no, we missed it. Oh dear. Actually, um, we might be able to do a replay on this. Andrew, I'm just going to send you something, um, which is from Oman. Uh, that was uh, Charges, uh, so our partners here, um, who are providing this feed that we're seeing, uh, secured another feed from Oman, which is in the path of annularity. Um, so we might take a little look at that. But anyway, uh, what I was going to say, folks, was been too much of me so far. Um, got any questions, anybody? Um, if you have, uh, unmute your microphone, because I won't be able to see all of the thumbnails there. Um, so there are some Q&As actually in there, aren't there? So yeah. Yeah, it's just people saying where they're from. Actually, where is everybody from? Uh, in chat, so you can go down and you can... Uh, talk in chat and say uh, say where you're from. But anybody got any questions so far on this Ring of Fire annular eclipse? Hi, Paul. Uh, I had just one tiny question, if you don't mind. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, where, where, wanted... where, are you, where are you speaking from, first of all? Um, I'm in Maryland right now. It's uh, 1.51 a.m. Oh, nice one. Well done for staying up. Good work. Yeah. What's the I question? just wanted to ask, uh, I... This is the first time I'm reading about Ant Umbra, so I just wanted to ask if uh, Umbra is supposed to be darker than Ant Umbra, or no? Yes, it is. So the umbral shadow is the one that causes a total solar eclipse. And it's darkest because the moon is large enough to cover the entire sun. You don't see anything of the sun. Now, there are variations of that. So if you think about that, umbral shadow being that cone. Um, if the moon is very close to the earth, then more of that cone is kind of penetrating earth, which actually means we get a far longer total solar eclipse because the moon is bigger, so it takes longer to go over. Right. But actually some of the best total solar eclipses are when the, the moon and the sun are very close uh, to okay. being 
the same size because that's when we get most Bailey's beads. It's when we get beautiful prominences that we can see Bailey's beads, by the way. So that this, you can see it here in our live stream, can't you? You can see just how close the apparent size of the sun and moon are. Correct. They're so close that on some eclipses, um, and in fact, you can even see it on some um, uh, annular eclipses like, like this one, but it, it, it's for a fleeting moment. Bailey's beads are the little bits of sunlight which are still able to come through the valleys which are on the limb of the moon. And they're the most beautiful things. They almost sparkle and you, you, you get them kind of sparkling around as the moon is slowly moving over. So umbral shadow, very, very dark because it basically obscures the entire sun. Then you've got this um, penumbral shadow and that's where Sharjah is at the moment. So this feed that we've got at the moment, they are in the penumbral shadow. So we're partially shaded, but we've still got some direct um, sunlight hitting us. So that's a lighter shadow. Then you've got this ant umbral shadow. And this ant umbral shadow is this weird thing. It's the extension of that umbral cone. And the cone kind of turns inside out, if you like. So we're, although the moon is centrally placed over the sun, we're still in some direct sunlight because it's not big enough to cover that, that ring of fire. Um, now, those are the three types of eclipses. But some people, and I wasn't actually aware that there's a fourth type of solar eclipse and it's called a hybrid eclipse. And this is what we witnessed in Africa. My calendar in my head is, I never remember yet. I, I don't know how old I am, let alone when this event actually occurred, but it's sometime over the last 10 years. Uh, Stan's laughing, Stan is sympathizing with me there. How, how it looks like he's sympathizing. Well. Um, but anyway, a hybrid eclipse is when the tip of that cone, so the tip of the umbral shadow is, and, and the, the spacing of it, don't forget that the, the earth is curved, right? So the distance that that tip is at changes depending on where it's hit the earth. So what you can land up with is a hybrid eclipse where, so in the case of today's path, when it hit on the west coast of Africa, we had a ring of fire eclipse, but then as the shadow moved across earth, it, the earth, basically the earth moon distance was closing between them and it then turned into a total solar eclipse. And you, you never see both at the same place, but on the West Coast, we had, on the West Coast of Africa, we had feeds coming in of an annular ring of fire eclipse. And then by the time it got over to Kenya, we experienced the, probably the most magical moment I've ever had uh, in astronomy. And it was this 13 seconds of totality. Um, and it was, it was so astonishing because it had been, we had had a dust storm just as we started our live coverage, we had to pack all the equipment up under big tents and tarpaulins and stuff like that. We had satellite communications, which were horrendous to try and stream live feeds on. And we'd, we'd had a, a five day expedition in four by fours over the roughest possible ground you could ever imagine across Africa in the worst conditions camping. And it was just exhausting. So the stress of actually getting there, we arrived late, we arrived at midnight and the eclipse was due to start early the next morning. Um, so all of that stress, and then we get clouded out, but then just at the moment of totality, we kept all the cameras running, bang, there was this opening in the clouds and we managed to see totality. And and, and the moment uh, in, in SLU has gone down in history because it's, uh, when Cox blubs, basically, um, a grown man was in tears. Um, so that was my qualification, really, for uh, probably joining this the students students uh, online space camp. I still cry, and I'm proud of it. Uh, anyway, listen. Any more questions? Thank you very much, uh, Satya. Uh, I hope I pronounce your son, your your name right. S and we managed to see oh, oh. totality. And, hey, um, uh, Francisco. And uh, in, in SLU has gone down in history because it's... Uh, I've, can you can you mute the show or get a microphone close to you because we're getting some feedback. Man with 
Um, yes. So that was my I, qualification, I a, really, for uh, probably with, joining uh, this for students, students uh, the, online uh, space camp. I still cry. Uh, and I'm proud of it. Uh, anyway, listen, any more Francisco, questions? Francisco, could you, could you mute your microphone? Because yeah, we're sure. getting quite a lot of um, feedback. You need to turn the volume down of, of the show. You've got the show, I think, playing somewhere. Um, and then ask. Uh, anybody else? While Francisco is... No, we still um, so we can still hear the show. Sorry, Francisco, I've had to mute you because we can hear the the background uh, of the event playing. Uh, while Francisco sorts that out, anybody else got any questions for us? <gasps> Look at that. Um, and I have a question for you. Awesome. Hey, Keith. Thank you very much for this wonderful show. I love the Star Party. And uh, on a lighter note. I'm in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, okay. Yes, sir. Uh, so on a lighter note, uh, apart from all the wonderful knowledge that we've learned, we have to get down to the nitty gritty. This is a quest. How many gravity points are we going to earn? For <laughs> 100 gravity points, Keith. Um, it's, That's it's, it. Um, I, listen, come on. If you look at the life cycle of stuff. SCA right, is 100. 200 gravity points for that. I, I did okay. think about this one, but... But come on, we, we're giving you <laughs> I'm an joking, easy. I'm joking. I, I know, I know. But we're giving you an easy ride because there are no questions in it. All right. So a lot of the quests have multi-choice questions and stuff like that. Um, Fair enough. So thank you for your excellent work. Yeah, we kind of. Uh, well, did one. you do the voiceover for the um, the Pluto rediscovery? Yes, I did. Yeah, I, yeah, 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 yeah. That's uh, it's fantastic. It's excellent. I, I am an educator, and I totally plan on uh, sharing that with my students. It's a great, it's my favorite, uh, my wow. favorite quest. Thank you so much. Well, for that. thank you very much for that. And we were trying something a little bit new. And we, Russ actually had quite a lot of positive feedback from a lot of the, the, the classrooms on that one. Um, and uh, John uh, Boisvert, who's been, who did the, his first quest launch last week, the life cycle, the life and death of stars, um, which is an epic quest, absolutely epic. Uh, he's he's going to do one of those kind of little video storylines, first of all. I'm also working on the next quest that I'm doing uh, is about sea feed variables, uh, which is uh, Henrietta Swan Levitt. Um, so we're going to tell the story of her. It's actually one of the levels that you can be um, at SLU, which is quite cool. Um, hey, Russ, uh, give us a th thumbs up. We'll, uh, are you coming back on to tell us a little bit more about Online Space Camp? I would love to talk about Online Space Camp. A among other things, I can talk about lots of things. And uh, you, you should hear me on Online Space Camp. And, and I would like to mention that, uh, you know, we, we jest a little bit about, uh, you know, can uh, uh, people who are not students uh, join online space camp, but they, they are on the SLU show page. So if you feel like you're missing out and you wanna go check it out, go check it out, go see what we're doing. Now, you, you can't be in our Zoom webinar unless you're a student, but that's um, just the, the way it is. And, um, you know, we do, we do things a little bit differently in because we're we are working with kids so we we don't promote everyone to panelists and that sort of thing um i i'm the only face people will see uh and that's just for privacy purposes yeah. so it's a, it's a safe environment isn't it and it's it the is, same in students is, corner club as well it, it is it is a completely safe environment um you know we want the kids to to feel like they can ask all the questions that they want um and uh you know and they certainly do we get tons of questions and um you know, I, I think, uh, you know, one thing that in, you were just talking about, and I, this is something that I always try to, to, to talk to my students about. Um, I've, I've been in the classroom for many, many years. Um, and, you know, with my students in the classroom, and, but also with my new students here at SLU, you know, I think you were talking about uh, see, seeing that eclipse that brought you to tears. Um, I think those, there's those special moments that we all have that can that can really change our lives and, and it can come down to a moment, you know, and, and there may be a student out there watching this show tonight. I mean, I think you've done such great work with this, this quest. I'm, I love it. I, I love this moment quest. Uh, it's just, it's just awesome. And all the quests are awesome. I mean, the work that you and your team are doing with the quests is so great. Um, they, Washington. they, 
they well i mean you deserve it they're they are they are life changing they're they're great they're great products and um you know they're they're wonderful things for students to experience and they're wonderful things for adults to experience as well um so i just uh yeah i don't i don't think we've it. ever we i don't it. think we've ever launched a feature russ in slew's what is it 17 year history since 2003 which has proved so popular um and, and one of the interesting things is that even the old hands even the experienced amateur astronomers amongst us you know are are, are doing them all um and you know the team's certainly enjoying creating them um and, and we've got a, a you know quite a good cross section in our quest creation team now you know so we're doing we, we've got some uh, really back to basics quests um for even uh, junior school kids coming up but also at the other end of the the scale we've got a whole stack of high school and, and college quests uh starting as well and you know all of these quests uh any normal normal slew member can can do any of them so uh, but yeah, we've got some great ones planned actually. Yeah, it's 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 so exciting. And one thing that I always uh, you know want to talk to my students about as well, and I say it I say it every night. And I so if they're out there listening, they're they're going to say, oh yeah, Russ is saying it again. I always tell them that the stars belong to them. You know, I mean, I think uh, we we hear the old stories and we we hear the we know the asterisms. That that the, the patterns that have been seen in the in the stars, but I I always encourage my kids to go out there and make up their own stories, make up your own asterisms. The stars are they belong to you just as much as they belong to anybody who's been on this planet. So, uh, you know, get out there and and make up your own stories about it. Have some fun with it, um, and uh, you know you'll you make make up some some little of your own patterns with your friends. Um, you know, go out at night, make up your own patterns, come back in and look up those stars that you were just looking at, look them up on SLU, plan a mission. Uh, I think those kinds of things are, are really, really amazing. And they, I think, highlight the, the power of, of, of what you can do with SLU when you can go outside and pick a star out of the sky and then come back in and point a telescope at it. Uh, it's pretty cool stuff, so. Um, uh, hey Russ, yeah. I've just I've just been I've just been told that um, on the uh, event page, uh, the Dubai Astronomy Group uh, feed is in the camera and live. But right. I would recommend to everybody at the moment this um, uh, the University of Sharjah feed um, at the moment I think is giving us my favourite view at the moment. Um, look at that. That's that's my favorite so far. So um, talking of quests, uh, Russ, uh, you're gonna, you gonna do something else. So while you do that, I'm just going to um, hop over to my quest and change my favorite image in, in my quest. Over okay, to you. great, yeah, please do. So, um, you know, I've, I've actually have some students who are, who are actually, e have been emailing me tonight. Uh, they're, jo they're joining right now and asking me how to, how to get involved with this. So. You know, certainly, you know, get in here. Um, if you're if you're on the the live uh, stream watching it, maybe um, you can you can join Slu and, and jump right in here and start on this quest. I think the quests are so there's such a powerful uh, tool for you to learn astronomy, and you're going to have some fun with it. You're going to earn some. Uh, you you heard uh, us talking earlier about gravity points, so. You know, you can earn gravity points and you can level up on SLU. So level up on SLU, you could challenge your friends to uh, some friendly competition. I know uh, in, my, in my astronomy club, um, one of my great friends, I think he's on this still right, right now, Todd Council, he's, he's always throwing uh, down the gauntlet about gravity points uh, to me. So, um, you know, start up a friendly competition with, with you and your friends. Um, you know, with uh, with students, they love it. They dig right in. They love to jump into those, uh, seeing who can get the most gravity points uh, within each club. You know, uh, from a classroom perspective, um, we use our astronomy club uh, with your class. So if you are an educator and you uh, you want to really get the most out of it, I certain you can certainly use it for demonstration purposes. But I think it's such a powerful thing when. Each kid has their own account, and each kid is able to um, earn their gravity points and see uh, 
see the fruits of their labor, their own labors, uh, as they're you know collecting images, uh, completing quests, earning gravity points, leveling up, um, you know, challenging themselves, challenging themselves, and challenging their friends. I think they can have a a, a ton of fun uh, doing this. Um, and certainly, the the quests are one way to do that. The other way is is just engaging with our clubs. So when you engage with our uh, clubs, uh, uh, you're you're engaging with the community. You're sharing the thing you know. You're sharing the research that you're doing. Uh, you're helping other people learn, and that's really something that's really important to us here at SLU is that we have uh, a lot of, I mean, people just sharing their knowledge, um, sharing their questions, sharing their answers, and and um, you know, you, we give you some gravity points for doing that. We want you to to enjoy your time on SLU, and we want you to to earn a little bit of points when you uh, when you're willing mm -hmm. to uh, you know put yourself out there. Absolutely. Uh, right, uh, uh, Ross. Have you got anything else for us at the moment? Uh, not at the moment. I mean, I I I I can read a, a Greek myth if people are interested. But uh, I know if my students were out there, they'd want that. But uh, you know, well, maybe maybe, maybe some... later as time wears as time wears on. Are you, are you we'll sure? On Greek myth. Are you sure we could do it now? If you if you fancy, <laughs> I think that would be a a nice little break for me. It might even give me the opportunity of getting reaching the kitchen. Getting oh. the kettle on. All right. Well, I mean, how long is this thing? Have I got time for breakfast as well? A full English breakfast, well, maybe. <laughs> maybe, maybe. What? It, what is? It, what is that? Is that? Is it poached eggs or what are you? What are you making? Full English breakfast: sausage, bacon, black pudding. Oh, black pudding, fried egg, uh, fried bread, uh, mushrooms, uh, tomatoes. Now I'm starting to dribble now. Sounds and great. My, I know. My you're, dog's you're, starting to dribble as well. So. You know, it's, I mean, it's late for me, but I, I could still go for a late <laughs> night good. breakfast. I mean, it's, that's the thing with a full English breakfast. It, it's just it like doesn't being have back to in be college. just breakfast. It can be any time of the day. Uh, nice. How long are you, how long, how long are you going to, to go for Ross? Well, I'm, I, I, I can, I can, I've got a, a whole book of Greek myths here. So <laughs> um, no, I, I, you know, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe 10 minutes, five, 10 Ooh. minutes. Is that yeah. too much? Is that no, too much? No, no. Uh, no, go, all right. Well, we'll we'll soon see. It depends how many people are left in 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 the <laughs> so Zoom start, webinar at the end start, of it. Really, isn't they it? They start <laughs> dropping off. Well, I would certainly understand uh, understand that. <laughs> no, it, I'm sure. No, you're, uh, this is a this is a gripping story. So, uh, well, you know, listen, yeah, one so, of one of the things, Russ, that uh, you know used to be the most popular thing that we used to do during shows is our producer was really into mythology and associated to astronomy and it always used to be an incredibly popular segment of the show and still you know astronomers learn the night sky by learning the constellations and it's you know there's no better way of learning the constellations than learning the original myths behind them so this is absolutely perfect so over to you for it okay all right well I'm going to jump right in then. So, you know, um, if you have a, if you have a cup of tea or something, this is, this is a good time for you to, to pull that out. Maybe, maybe get a snack, that sort of thing. I'm just going to, I'm going to read a story to you and hopefully I don't, um, I don't, I don't butcher the names too much. Um, I was born in Greece, but I am not, I'm not Greek. Uh, I was born in Athens. My father was in the, the U S Navy and was stationed over there. But, um, so I've always felt uh, uh, a, a connection to the Greek myths, um, and I will do my best. This one's the Chariot of the Sun. So this this uh, talks about the sun, but also maybe a little bit about what we're what we're involved in today. So Helios, son of the Titans Hyperion and Thea, was the god who drove the Chariot of the Sun each day from east to west across the sky, spreading light and warmth over the world. At nightfall, he would return to his home in the east in a great golden bowl, born on the river Oceanus, which encircled the earth. There he would rest before preparing to set off once more on his journey as morning drew near again. His chariot was of gold, drawn by four fiery horses with golden manes, and he himself wore a golden helmet, sparkling with jewels of all kinds. Everyone who looked at him had to shade their eyes to avoid being blinded by the dazzling shafts of light that played all around him. Phaeton was Helios's son by Clymene, the, night, the Nereid, one of the 50 daughters of Nereus, the sea god. He was brought up in the then fertile land of Egypt. 
Though Phaeton could see his father from a distance each time he passed across the sky, Helios' home was far away and his daily task left no time for him to visit his child. If he had done so, the story of Phaeton might have well been a happier one. For as the boy grew up, he was taunted by his companions. They did not believe him when he told them he was that the sun god was his father. They thought that it was an idle boast to cover up the fact that Phaeton's father had left home. I will prove to you that you are wrong, Phaeton said angrily, for he was proud of his father and his mother had taught him always to stand up for himself in arguments. He thought for a while and decided that there was only one way in which he could show that he was telling the truth. He must visit Helios and ask of him a favor, which, if granted, would leave no doubts in the minds of the other boys. So he set off, and after many days reached the place where his father's palace towered up beyond the eastern horizon. I am Phaeton, your son, he said, as soon as he came to his father. I have journeyed a long way from the home of my mother in Egypt to see the God who is my father and to ask him a favor. Helios granted his son warmly. You have only to ask, he said at once. But when Phaeton asked him what he wished to do, he frowned. What you ask is not possible, he said. Ask anything of me but that. Skill and experience and great strength of arm are needed to do what you suggest. You are too young still to be entrusted with such a task. For Phaeton, of course, had asked his father if for one day he could take Helios's place and drive the sun chariot across the sky. His friends would then see him and could not doubt that he had spoken the truth. Phaeton continued pleading and for a while Helios remained firm, but he had given his word and eventually he reluctantly granted his wish. Very well, very well he said at last but it must be for one day only. My horses are wild and untamed, and since time began, no one but myself has been entrusted to, to control them and hold them to their course. Go with great care. Drive neither too high nor too low. Follow the broad path we have beaten over the centuries, and keep your hands always firmly on the reins. For if the horses are given their own leads, disaster will surely follow. Dawn was approaching fast as Phaeton climbed into the sun god's chariot and took the reins in his hands. The horses seemed quiet and docile, and he felt confident as he cracked his whip and spurred them away into the clear night air. Up into the heavens they soared, and as they went, their light first touched the tops of the hills in the east, spreading downwards to the valleys and to the villages crouching in the hollows below. The horses tossed their heads and their golden manes streamed out behind them. A wild light came into their eyes as they felt once more the freedom of the skies. And they sensed that the strong arm and iron will of Helios was not there to guide them. As they passed over Phaeton's homeland, he looked down and saw far below the tiny houses where he and his friends lived, the doors still firmly shut against the night. How will they know me? thought Phaeton. I must take the horses down lower so that they will recognize me and see just what it means to have a god for a father. Cracking his whip over the horses' heads, he urged them downwards, away from the path beaten across the sky by a million journeys down towards the earth. The horses plunged wildly, diving down closer than Phaeton had intended so that the trees and rocks seemed to swoop up at him, then away as the chariot veered suddenly sideways and up again. From the corner of his eye, he saw a panic-stricken group of his friends cowering beside his house. Then they disappeared from view again as the fiery chariot dipped and rolled. By now, the horses knew that they were the masters. They skimmed low over the earth's surface, searing the trees and grasses, withering the corn and setting cities ablaze with the terrible heat of the sun. The fertile land of Egypt became a red, barren desert, except for a thin thread of green where the Nile waters flowed. For a time, even the great river itself shrank to nothing as the water boiled and steamed. The next minute, the horses were galloping high at the edge of the sky itself, while the earth below grew cold and the seas froze into great blocks of ice. 
Phaeton cried out to his father for help, but the sun god could do nothing. It seemed that the whole earth must perish. And so it might have done had not Zeus, watching always from Olympus, seized one of his thunderbolts and hurled it with deadly aim at the boy. Phaeton fell from the chariot with a great cry and plunged down to earth, falling to his death at a place called Eridnus. There, water nymphs wept with sorrow, cooling his burned body with their tears, trying in vain to revive him. It is said that Zeus took pity on the mourners and turned them into poplar trees, their tears into drops of amber. There they stand forever, sighing in the wind, cooling the earth around them with their fluttering leaves. Helios set out sadly to look for his runaway chariot. He found it high in the mountains of Ethiopia, parching the land for miles around as the four horses stamped and whinnied in confusion. Helios threw his cloak over their wild eyes to calm them and led them quietly back to their stable in the west, flying slowly and carefully high above the usual path. And for the rest of that day, darkness covered the land. And that's from a wow. book called Gods, Men, and Monsters. So love this book. It's one I've had since I was a kid. Gods, men, and monsters, Russ, right? From the Greek myths, of course. Now, there's so many other myths, too. And, I mean, it'd be great to have people share those. Maybe in chat, they could mention at least some of the names of the stories that they might know about the sun or about a, an eclipse of the sun. There's plenty of them out there. So, I could contribute a little one, if you move me. Yes, go Milton. Okay. Well, uh, I'm from Bolivia originally, South America. And in South America, we have a very strong belief in the sun, right? And um, um, just briefly, I'd like to share my screen if you allow me. Yeah, if the uh, studio can do that. Emmanuel, Todd, can we uh, allow Milton to do that? As you work that out, uh, probably I should start saying that uh, around there, the, the sun has a different name. It's called Inti, I-N-T-I. -I. And um, for, that, uh, <clears throat> for that culture, let's say the sun is, uh, is very powerful. Um, And this is a picture I'd like to share with you uh, on the center of that uh, oh, gate. Okay. Uh, you can actually see the, the, the picture of the sun as uh, it was uh, envisioned by the natives of, uh, the, of my country. Yeah. Uh, Inti is the creator of everything and that's why the, the position is in the middle of the, of the gate. This is called actually the sun gate. And on this day, uh, exactly, the sun will come out uh, and, you know, uh, will go directly through that uh, door that you see, the gate that you see. Ah, because it was solstice. Uh, the winter just, solstice. Uh, about tw uh, 10 hours ago. Um, exactly. So, yeah. Okay, brilliant. And okay. so people go there, of course, not uh, this year because of uh, social distancing, but people go there by thousands and uh, they receive the first uh, uh, rays of the sun on this day and i just wanted to share that with everybody um, it's Brilliant. Uh, part of the south american culture and i hope you liked it thank you absolutely milton and that's exactly you know what what we really want these star parties to be you know for for, for you lot to come in as as well um and and share stuff like that i mean that was um that there's a whole number of uh, monuments. Uh, can give me a thumbs up if you can see the the live feed again. Yeah, um, there are a whole stack of uh, monuments around the globe um, which have these solar alignments. There's the tomb, I think, in Ireland, uh, where it's a, a a large dome, earth covered tomb, but there's a very narrow stone lined um, tunnel. Uh, into it, into a small chamber inside. 
and I, I, I suspect it's on a solstice rather than an equinox, but on the morning, the sunshine beams straight the way down the tunnel. Then just down the road for me in Wiltshire in the southwest of England, we've got Stonehenge, um, all sorts of astronomical alignments, but mainly they were measuring uh, the solstice and the equinox because that was what really drove them, you know, to start a season of planting. Um, you know, so just a, just a reminder, you know, this might be ring of fire annular eclipse, but quite rarely for uh, some people in some time zones, certainly you lot over in the USA, it's this eclipse has occurred on the day of solstice, which was actually Saturday the, the 20th. Um, it was 09 UTC, no, sorry, 21 UTC, something like that, about 10 hours ago. So this is where this is. A lot of people call it summer solstice, but that's kind of uh, a bit rude. I, as you heard from, from Milton there, you know, down in Bolivia and South America, it's the winter solstice. So it is, it's far better to call this the June solstice, but it's basically when Earth's uh, northern hemisphere is tilted most towards the sun. Now, Andrew Dumbleton, SLU's ops manager and myself, when we're operating the Canary 5 solar telescope, uh, we notice this because, our clamshell domes, they open on one side and then the other. And the way I installed it, the you've got one set of shutters on the north, one set of shutters on the south. At the moment, we only have to open the north shutters a little bit. Um, we reach equinox and we have to open both shutters a little bit. And then when we hit uh, December, sorry, and September, then we only have to open the the south shutters. So we notice these little changes, you know, and as the weeks progress, we have to open it, it, it opens in kind of notches. Um, and we have to add a notch on a particular day and a, a certain time of day. Sometimes, if we're not keeping an absolute close eye on it, you might notice that the stream goes black. That's when we haven't opened it quite enough when it's kind of setting or anything like that. But uh, Andrew did bring um, the Canary 5 Solar Telescope online yesterday uh, as a little special bonus. We don't normally operate it at the weekend, uh, but so we could see that, see the sun um, on June solstice. Um, so summer, summer solstice in the Northern Hemisphere, winter solstice uh, in the sun. And, you know, you might think, well, hold on a second, the longest day, how can summer just be beginning on the longest day? Well, don't forget that astronomical seasons are different to meteorological season. So meteorological um, summer started at the beginning of the month um, because they meteorologists like to work in whole months. All right. This is one of the reasons why meteorological seasons are always start at the end and beginning of a month. And they base it on um, average temperatures. So that's what they base it on. Um, but astro in astronomy, the date for um, June solstice can actually change from, I think it's the 20th to 22nd, or it may be slightly longer than that. Um, so it, it changes depending on what year it is. We've, I think we've had two lots of the 20th of June and maybe another 20th of June next year, um, but it does, it does flex. But anyway, listen, let's get back to what we have up on our screens at the moment. I think this is an absolutely glorious view. This is from uh, Mashur Ahmed al Wadat, who is a professor of astrophysics at the University of Sharjah. They actually run the planetarium there. Now, if you ever are fortunate enough um, to travel travel to United Arab Emirates, make sure you go to the Emirate of Sharjah, uh, where this is. And they have got one of the most extraordinary planetariums uh, you have ever seen. Um, it cost an absolute arm and a leg. Uh, they have a small uh, dome, uh, but it's incredibly well equipped just outside the planetarium. And that's where this feed is coming from at the moment. And I think yeah, so far they've, they've given us the, the best views we've had, I think, today. Um, that is absolutely glorious. And uh, I just want to give a shout out actually to it's Mohammed Fadil Talafa, uh, who's the guy who's operating this for us today. Uh, now, we have had other feeds. We've had the uh, let's just hop over actually to the Dubai Astronomy Group. Um, wow, look at that. They've got uh, five of their members feeds. So the Dubai Astronomy Group is probably one of the most 
established uh, groups of amateur astronomers, and to call them amateur, I mean, it's just, it doesn't do them justice. Um, that it, they, they do outreach across the entire region, um, but they travel out into the desert, you know, the, the, the first um, spotting. In fact, the next couple of days is gonna be really, really important. Uh, obviously in, uh, in the Muslim world because the new moon or the sighting of the new moon is what starts the next calendar month for them. So one of the things that I've often wondered is, and, I, and I've asked this of some of the guys at the Dubai Astronomy Group, can, does that observation of the new moon, the, the new waxing crescent moon, have to be visual with eyes or can it be uh, using optical aids. And this actually changed a couple of years ago um, when uh, they, they actually made a proclamation that it could be a sighting through um, telescopes. And one of the things I've often wondered, I should have asked them before the show, we are seeing the new moon now. We're, we're seeing the youngest new moon that it's ever possible to see when it's silhouetted during a solar eclipse of any kind. Now, I suspect that this is not classed as that sighting, but maybe we've got uh, got a, a, a member who's in the in the Zoom webinar who who knows anything about that. But it would be interesting. But anyway, uh, over the next few days, they're going to be out in the desert making these sightings of the incredibly young moon, and then that gets the go ahead and the official thumbs up. Say, okay, it's the start of the next. Um, calendar month in the Muslim calendar. Um, so, but these are absolutely cracking feats. Now, these are all live, of course. So, what we're seeing is some of them. Uh, so, the middle one at the top, uh, Baya, Bala, it looks like, um, is it looks like it's covering more of the sun. Actually, the one down in the bottom left, I won't even try and pronounce that one, but you can see it's still kind of covering about half the sun. One down on the bottom right, though. Uh, it's, you know, the moon is edging away to the side. So if we go back to what we were talking about right at the beginning, we can, we can almost locate these visually to how close they are to that path of annularity. Um, and we know that the one down in the bottom right is further away. Where is it? Salala. That's a cool name, isn't it? And we know that uh, the one in bottom left, we know that that's closer to the path of annularity because they get a deeper eclipse. It can also be along the line as well, of course. So um, they could be further east and west and that's going to affect that. Now I have had some word, uh, I don't, don't know if Andrew's around at the moment, but I have had word that Sursa in India is suffering from clouds, um, partial clouds. Now we are keeping a very close eye uh, on the feed that we were expecting from there. It'll be a, an awful shame. Oh, we... sorry, sorry yes. to disturb, but now this Dubai Astronomy Group feed comes from this India. Which one? Channel. Sorry, which one? So we lost now the India transmission. So did did so you I say that? Tried... Did you say that the Dubai Astronomy Group are using an Indian feed? Yeah. Which one, do you know? Or or on on the Sluice page. Ah, right, so okay. Dubai comes from one. Okay, so I, I haven't, Andrew Sorry. hasn't alerted me to that. So um, let's just hop over and, and have a quick look because uh, I wasn't aware of that. So thank you hey, very Paul, much. Paul, there you. was one question and I don't know if you have uh, thoughts on it. Um, yes, go. One of my uh, space campers asked um, that feed in the bottom left. It had a white spot in the center. Any thoughts on that? Do you do you know what that is? Uh, yes, I just do. The, Let's just okay. hop back to it. Um, it's it's purely the exposure um, that they're using for the camera setup. So all of these are using special filters that actually filter out the vast majority um, of the sunlight. Uh, that's hitting the camera. And that particular one, the way they've set up their camera and telescope just means that it's kind of burning out a little bit, not literally, but 
um, it's saturating the image. The, the sun is too bright at its center. Um, so that's that's all that is. There's nothing uh, ominous there. Um, so, uh, but anyway, thank you for that, Yari. Um, I just checked those feeds, um, and there was a, a that you can do a quick snap of this. It's not going to be great for the poster, I guess. Your your poster, but uh, Andrew, uh, maybe you can give me an update at some point. Just butt in. Uh, have we got any other questions from anybody at the moment for this Ring of Fire? annular eclipse. Well, I, the, I was just going to show you real quickly. Yeah, cool. I was inspired oh, yeah. by Milton. And here's a, a, one of the oldest representations of the sun and moon. Uh, just came in the mail today from a craftsman. And wow. it is um, uh, supposed to be the Nebra sky disk. So we've got a view of the sun and the moon and uh, uh solstice represented the angles and things so i thought that was kind of fun what did you uh, call it paul i i don't think i've heard of that before uh the nebra n-e-b-r-a uh sky disc was found in in germany and I, i'm trying Ooh. to think how far back it dates something like gosh several thousand years bce and uh, so it's supposed to be the oldest uh accurate representation of the cosmos and, and it's got wow. they think the pleiades on it and some other things uh, maybe the solar uh ship down at the bottom so people were interested as you mentioned and jenny and i got a chance to see new grange so we're kind of interested in uh archaeoastronomy so it's fun to see how people captured this before they had slew they had to do something right so exactly yeah uh, <laughs> they, they pass it they pass it around the campfire presumably but, <laughs> thank you so much for that because i You're have welcome. never I've never heard of that one. And archaeoastronomy is a subject I could very easily get into. Uh, I, 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 I was fascinated by archaeology. The first thing I ever wanted to be when I was six was a geologist. Then I found out you could be a paleontologist, but then I also found out you could be an archaeologist. And I'm continuously digging up stuff in my old house, in the, in the garden and stuff. But, you know, archaeoastronomy and being so close to Stonehenge and Helen Avery, slew astronomer um, Helen Avery, if you remember, she used to do an awful lot of these stories about these different sites, um, which were, you know, for astronomical observation of one kind or another. But of course, we're still doing it. So these sites like Stonehenge and the one that Milton showed us, you know, where the solstice sun is, is coming through the doorway there, uh, we're still doing it. Have you heard of Manhattan Henge, anybody? So Manhattan Henge is the streets of Manhattan are aligned um, east-west, like so many US cities, but there's a particular, their particular street pattern on a particular day of the year, the sun either rises or sets, it's probably both, exactly down the, the main streets. And the streets get absolutely crowded. We did a show, a live show there once, um, and Trisha Ennis, uh, the, the person I was telling you about um, with the mythology, um, she was there and reported live for us there. And it's amazing, you know, you've got all of the skyscrapers and this really narrow street because it's so high. And then this glorious sunrise, I think it was sunset actually. But anyway, so it's Manhattan Henge and there are other um, city henges around as well. Now, listen, we've got a live feed up here. Um, Hanley, now maybe, uh, maybe somebody can can look up where Hanley is because I've got a sneaking suspicion that the Dubai Astronomy Group um, may be grabbing some feeds from some of their partners in India as well. I've just been looking and our India feed is still uh, clouded out in Sursa. They're kind of getting little glimpses of it. Um, but this is this this has to be right. So we know this um, has to be further west because so much of the sun was covered there. So I don't know if anybody's had a quick look to see where Hanley was. Um, North Rea Astronomy Center, so I think that's in the Middle East. Anybody look up Hanley? God, you lot are hopeless. I've got to do everything myself. <laughs> the title in the feed says India. It does, does it? Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, I, no, that's, no that's, on, that's on our webpage. So, um, that, that just hasn't been changed. Andrew hasn't changed that. Um, so don't be, um, don't be led astray uh, on that one. Um, uh, Divya's here. Divya, you don't happen to know, do you, if Hanley is um, 
in India? Yes. It is? Yeah. Oh, excellent. Okay. So uh, uh, Divya, by the way, is um, the, the leader of the SLU Ambassador Programme. And Divya, you're going to be telling us a little bit more about that uh, a bit later on, aren't you, in the show? Yeah. Maybe 15, 20 minutes time, something like that. So uh, I think it is time we did a little recap. While you lot are getting your questions together, otherwise you leave me hanging, um, I'm just going to change the feed over to this because I think this is absolutely glorious. Look at that, we're getting the glow around it as well. Sun rising there in the Middle East as, as, as the, the eclipse progresses. Uh, but I want you lot to get some questions together. While I just do a little bit of a recap uh, of where we are. So this is uh, a SLU live star party for members, you lot. Uh, but we're also um, out um, to YouTube and, um, you know, all that interweb stuff. You know, it's, it's 7.30 a.m. here. Come on, it's an excuse. You know, Twitter and Facebook and that kind of thing. Um, so we're out live on those as well. And this is an annular ring of fire eclipse so ring of fire because the moon doesn't quite cover the entire solar disk so we land up seeing this annulus around it um there's a lot of um miss um mistranslations of that as well annulus just means ring shaped um that was that was the original latin but apparently it was um the in medieval times they added an N and stuff like that and, and misinterpreted the translation. Um, but anyway, what we've been seeing so far, we did see a couple of rings of fire, but that was uh, very, very briefly from the Dubai Astronomy Group feed. This feed, though, I think has actually been my favourite. So this is from our partners, the Sharjah Academy for Astronomy, Space Science and Technology. And listen, if, if you do get to the Middle East, you really need to go there. I've never seen a facility like it in my life. And there are partners down there, and we're going to be putting in a new observatory uh, down there in the not too distant future. The pandemic has put us a little bit behind, but uh, just um, just keep an eye on on this feed because if you look carefully, we've got quite a little bit of kind of scintillation because of the atmosphere and it's heating up there, obviously during the day. Um, but if you do look closely on this, I bet you a pound to a penny, some of the little bumps and ridges that we're actually seeing on the moon silhouette, on the moon shadow, um, are actually mountains, crater edges, valleys, and things like that. And that's what uh, you can, what can call Bailey's beads when the sunlight just ripples through that. And if, if we can, if we'll stick with this feed um, uh, until it, just until four, it's called fourth contact, basically when the moon uh, leaves the sun, we might just see some of those Bailey's beads just as it leaves. It's easier to see it when it's um, ingressing, but we may just see a, a few of those. So we're keeping an eye on that. Uh, actually, while Andrew's uh, there, uh, Andrew, you're doing a sterling job there. I know you're kind of juggling, you know, different feeds into different slots and things like that. But have you got any news on uh, India? No, I can just see in the chat, um, nobody had managed to watch it through that particular feed that we had. Um, yeah. They were sharing other feeds uh, in that chat, um, but it still hadn't started, but I'm just about to check again. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I, I think, you know, they are suffering from a bit of cloud there. The one feed that I did see on one of their news channels was uh, incredibly blurry, but uh, right, so, um, Shall we have, unless anybody's got any questions, shall I take you through our first moment quest? Anybody got any questions? I'll give you 10 seconds, right? 10 seconds of silence. Uh, go on. Oh, go on. Someone broke. Yes. Samir, yeah, hi, uh, hello. Hi, Samir. Uh, this is from India. So uh, I just asked in the chat also, uh, do you guys do any kind of analysis or spectroscopy uh, during all these eclipses or any any kind of new research work which is going on right now? Not at, not at the moment and not for this eclipse, but all of the okay. uh, SLU expeditions that I've been on um, with mm -hmm. our partners in the Canary Islands, the Institute of Astrophysics of the Canary Islands, 
we take loads of experiments on those trips. So we do a lot of environmental uh, monitoring uh, around the, the area and outside of the path of totality. Um, they, they have um, zoologists there who monitor um, wildlife and the reaction to wildlife. The best one we ever did there was a, a trip for the transcontinental eclipse in the USA when we went to uh, one of the huge uh, zoos, from the, I've forgotten which one it was, but I did a wander around with the head keeper there um, and they were getting the general public to look at all the webcams to monitor uh, the change in animal behavior as totality struck. Uh, but we don't do any spectroscopy and I'm not sure if, if, if anybody does really during solar eclipses. I mean, the total solar eclipses, if, if you remember, was uh, you know, were the only opportunity uh, before we had, you know, fancy telescopes or um, uh, space telescopes where we could see uh, the, the sun's corona, which is its outer atmosphere, its crown that goes all the way around it. A total solar eclipse used to be the only time when scientists could actually observe that. So these fleeting moments, you know, between a few seconds and a couple of minutes of totality for these eclipses what used to be incredibly important scientifically. Um, but no, we don't do um, in, any spectroscopy on this uh, at all, and certainly not when we're actually present. But there's an awful lot of science when we go on our eclipse, eclipse expeditions okay. with the EAC. So uh, uh, apart from eclipse, so do you guys are planning to add on any quest uh, related to spectrum analysis? I mean, via uh, remote telescopes? There's, there's the possibility. We've been discussing it for a time. But the first ones that we'd probably land up doing are, are some photometry quests. Um, but because of the setup of our uh, telescopes, uh, we, they're unmanned. So we can't, unless we had a specific telescope which had a spectrograph on it, and it was on it all the time, we can't switch out instruments on a night-to-night -night basis. Uh, there are some special filters that you can use and diffraction gratings and things like that, uh, which we are looking at, certainly for some student quests um, in that field. So, so watch this space, I think, is the, uh, that's a good catchphrase, isn't it? This, yeah. Watch this space. Sure. Uh, watch this space. Uh, but uh, yeah, we've, we've had a lot of feedback. And I know Russ has had a bit of feedback on this as well from some of the college colleges that are signing up for SLU. So thank you, Samir. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot. Uh, anybody else got any questions at all? Hey, Paul. Good morning, everyone. Is that Tiago or Thiago? Tiago. Tiago. Sorry, I, the third one. I, I knew I'd get I it wrong. Think, I'm straight from Brazil. It's a pleasure to uh, talk to you and everyone. And I, I don't speak English very well, but I try, I try to talk something. But it's better first, than my Portuguese. Portuguese? Is that what you say? No, I'm saying your English is better than my Portuguese. Ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, first of all, uh, I would like to congratulations for uh, for this stream uh, Thank you. And, and congratulations to all slow team. It's a pleasure to join uh, with you. And so. I'm very excited to learn uh, astronomy uh, in this platform mm -hmm. like ISLU. So thanks so much for your team. Welcome. Okay. Thank you. Um, and you know, how long have you been a member? A few months. Okay. Three so months. You, you're doing exactly the right thing because so many people join SLU and they, they're afraid to kind of put their head above the parapet. They're afraid to kind of come on here and talk or ask questions in the clubs or anything like that. And some of the feedback that I've had over the years have been people who have been there for three months and said, I wish I'd just asked those questions. And somebody even apologized yesterday when they were in one of the clubs and they asked a question that they thought was really basic, but it doesn't matter. Every single one of us, when we first started out learning astronomy, had those really, really basic questions. But the thing I most love about the SLU community, and I do bang on about it because it is so different 
that everywhere else, every other community I've ever seen on the internet, you know, has got the trolls and stuff like that. The SLU community has never had that because all of us, I think, remember how daunting it was when we first started, you know, learning about astronomy. And it's just such a massive subject that it looks impenetrable. But I always say one step at a time, one question at a time. And before you know it, within a couple of months, the things that you thought were really, really difficult a couple of months ago, you're actually teaching the next new member. You know, uh, so there's never a basic question and certainly nobody ever has to apologize for asking a question that maybe was asked before. You know, because frankly, I don't know about you lot, but if I see the same question answered several times, it's usually in a slightly different way, sometimes by slightly different people. And that actually just expands and kind of consolidates my understanding, you know, of, of whatever was being asked to start off with. So I really urge everybody, you know, dive in. You know, there's a SLU club there for absolutely everything. Go over to the Ptolemy Club, uh, which is the new to SLU club. So if you've got questions, if you are new to SLU today and you've got questions about you know, how to use it, because there's a lot of places to go on the SLU website. You know, we've got a, some lovely developments coming up, which can make that a lot easier. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of places to go. So don't be afraid to ask questions. Uh, if you hit a technical snag, you know, um, then just email support at slu.com and we'll help you out there. All this chat as well, but actually if you've got a question, it's probably easier to ask it in a club just in case it gets lost in chat because if you're up late and somebody else isn't around to answer it. Kind of stuff. So anyway, any other questions at the moment? Otherwise we will take a quick look at the quest. This, I'm sorry, I've got, a, I've got something to do in the meantime. Uh, follow along if you want. Paul? Uh, yes. Yeah. I want ooh, to talk some, one more thing. And yes. do you know Sobral, a city in Brazil? No, I don't. So can you so can you spell I, I it? I would like to share. I would like to share you. And uh, affect it. Uh, sometimes it is unknown for the people about the eclipse in 1919 hmm. that they compose the. Relativity general theory of yes. Einstein. So I, I hear, I think, uh, poster, uh, I don't know if you. Yeah, we can see it. Yeah? Yeah. So uh, last year, uh, we have an event to celebrate this discovery. Just in a total eclipse of the sun and the keep of Royal Society could uh, verify the light shifting. Okay. So once okay. again, uh, you know, an eclipse being used, you know, to confirm the theory of, of relativity. And, you know, so there's still some science. It's, we, we, um, we used to have a, a guest on a lot of our eclipse shows, uh, Dr. Lucy Green. She's a solar physicist, astrophysicist in the UK. Uh, she's she's written a, a terrific book, um, twelve thousand degrees or something like that. Um, but you know, a, a, a common question I used to ask her during those eclipses was, you know, do scientists still depend on eclipses, you know, to perform certain scientific measurements or anything like that? And unfortunately, the answer was no, um, because. We do have space telescopes. We can we observe the sun continuously now using those telescopes like SOHO, um, uh, continuously in a whole range of wavelengths. And of course, they don't suffer the same problems of looking through the atmosphere. Uh, but as Russ said earlier, um, Sue's director of education, I can see him over there. Um, he he mentioned earlier, do check out the Canary Five uh, Solar Telescope, which will be it should be online tomorrow. Um, it's not going to be online uh, later today, but in fact, let's just hop over and let's just uh, see what the forecast is. I'm, I'm going to take another snap of that charger feed. Uh, remind me, uh, sh somebody shout to me if um, if that charger feed is getting near the end. So I'm just going to hop over to one of the telescope pages, Canary One, and we'll see the. Oh, look at that! Look, there's um, sunrise in the Canary Islands. This is from our Pico del Tedi cam. So it's difficult to see here, but this is the silhouette of the island down here, the black stuff, so the big volcano, big shield volcano. Uh, you can see over there another black lump 
which is actually under the clouds. So this is the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, Africa is about 300 miles off in that direction. This is the neighboring island of Gran Canaria. And there we've got, uh, this, this actually would make a good quest, wouldn't it? This particular view, where we're seeing sunrise at the moment, is the furthest north, the furthest left in this photo that we're going to see this year, uh, because it was solstice, June solstice yesterday. So the Earth's tilted northern hemisphere is tilted towards the sun. Um, so that's quite cool. Let's have a look, actually, because we could see the same thing in the all sky camera as well. Look at that. So this, this camera is our all sky camera that operates 24 hours a day. And we can see here that uh, north is up, east is left, west is right. And you can see just the sun is rising in the northeast, basically, because of Earth's tilt. Uh, later on in the year, uh, the sun will rise further down here. But uh, I just wanted to have a, a quick look, see what the conditions were there. Oh, look at that, it's a dome cam. So the uh, these are actually, while I'm here, um, the, just for any, anybody who is new, the middle dome here. So this is at the Institute of Astrophysics of the Canary Islands. So this is our flagship observatory. The middle dome there is dome one. That's where uh, the Canary one half meter telescope is. This dome over here on the right is dome two. That contains two telescopes, the Canary 2 uh, wide field and ultra wide field telescopes. And the dome very close to us here, that's dome three. Um, and that contains the Canary 4 solar system telescope, the Canary 3 deep sky telescope, which is a nighttime telescope. But it also contains the Canary 5 solar telescope, which is this telescope that looks at the sun during the day uh, in a wavelength called H alpha, hydrogen alpha. Uh, and it gives us superb views of solar features and prominences coming off the side and stuff like that. So that's quite cool. Uh, do look at, uh, do check out the time lapses on these because they do, uh, they do look pretty cool. So that's probably yesterday morning. So it'll probably go dark in a second. That's yesterday morning. Let's see sunrise this morning. That was yesterday when the dome was open and you open the day and then it gets to sunset and then it should click into this morning sunrise. So then it's going to go dark last night. Oh, dome's open. That was cool, wasn't it? Did you see that? Boom. All the dome's opening. And then sunrise this morning. Look at that. So, oh, looks like we've got some insect life in the um, in the camera. Interesting. Uh, right. Any other questions, folks? And I'll otherwise I'll go through the quest quickly. Uh, Russ, are you going to come in and do anything for us? I mean, uh, you know, when I, I, I feel like um, it's, it's always so important when we, whenever we take a look at the sun and I, I think about it with um, my students, whether they're astronomy students or environmental science students um, or really just any student, um, it's, I think it's so crucial that people have a nice general understanding of you know, the processes that are going on in the sun, you know, so um, I, and I don't know if anyone, no one's really asked the question, um, but I think it'd be fun to talk a little bit about the, you know, the nuclear processes that are, that are happening. Um, I think that's always good for, you know, if I had some students on here and I bet there are some students out there who are watching who, and, and, and people, you know, have maybe some misunderstandings. Uh, it's one of the things that we do misunderstand about our, our star, you know, that this is a, a huge fusion reactor. You know, um, the sun's composed, you know, primarily of hydrogen, um, you know, about 90% hydrogen, 10% um, uh, helium. Um, and in the, in the core of the sun, we have fusion occurring, you know, where uh, those hydrogen, those protons, those hydrogen uh, ions are, are being fused into helium. And, you know, at the same time, they're releasing some energy. So, you know, everybody's really, everyone's familiar with, and we talked a little bit about Einstein earlier um, and how important uh, eclipses were to his work um, and confirming um, the theory of relativity. But, you know, really looking at that mass energy equivalence, that E equals MC squared equation. You know, we see it whenever you see a, a cartoon or a, 
TV show or, you know, Saved by the Bell or something like that. There's always E equals MC squared written somewhere on the chalkboard in the back. And, you know, but I, I think that, uh, you know, it's, it's good for people to, to know what that really means. You know, it's really looking at the fact that mass and energy um, are equivalent, you know, there's an equivalence here. So, um, you know, when the energy that, that, you know, at, when we look at the sun and we see that energy coming out and, uh, you know, our, our planet intercepts a tiny bit of that, well, um, you know, that's actually stuff from the sun that's being converted into energy and then thrown into space. So our, our, our star loses a little bit of, little bit of mass all the time. Um, you know, I think that's, and I think that's, when I learned that, uh, it kind of blew me away. Um, I, and I the think figures that's... are astonishing, aren't they, Russ? You know, the amount of mass that the sun is losing every second. You know, you, you start to think, how, how on earth can it still be there? You know, if it's losing <laughs> that much, you know, of, it, of its mass, you know, every second. Yeah, I, and, I, and that is so important, I think, to, to start thinking about just how well, massive this thing is, right? Like how yeah. oh, it's so big, you know, and I wish I had my basketball and my sesame seed. <laughs> what was I thinking? I, sh I could go, I could go get them. But, um, you know, if you've got a basketball uh, and you've got a sesame seed, well, you've got a, a relatively uh, decent sun earth scale model. Mm -hmm. So go get your sesame seed, go get your basketball. And, and that's, that's the earth compared to the sun. It gives you an idea of how, just how, you know how large the sun is and yeah it's losing it's losing mass all the time um you know in that in that conversion from uh you know from uh hydro hydrogen to helium you know there's a, if you look at the if we look at the atomic weights right there's a little bit of difference there and that's that's the stuff that's converted into energy and thrown out into space and you know our planet our planet so small compared to the sun intercepts just a a tiny little bit of that. Um, and that's what provides all, you know, uh, all, well, not all the energy. There's obviously some energy in the hydrothermal vents um, at the bottom of the ocean, right? Those are um, from radioactive decay in our planets and in, in the planet's interior. But, you know, all the life at the surface, you know, we all depend on that tiny slice of, uh, of energy that we energy, get yeah. from the sun, you know? I mean, it's a lot for us. It's a tiny slice compared to what the sun is constantly throwing out into space. And, um, you know, so anyway, that's... Yeah, Russ, you know, you mentioned, you know, how massive the sun is. And, you know, it is by, on a, on a human scale. But uh, anybody who's interested in learning a little bit more about what Russ was saying there, check out John's new uh, Life and Death of Stars quest. Uh, because that will take you on a journey to some super giant stars, which make our sun look an insignificant pinhead, you know, in the in the in the galaxy. Um, these supermassive stars, over thirty times the mass of our sun, um, and, and that that whole quest is talking about a sun's initial mass governs how long it's going to live big stars massive stars burn through that energy that russ was talking about you know really really quickly and end their lives in cataclysmic cosmic explosions called supernovae our sun actually is considered to be a dwarf star would you believe you know and it's pretty small it's uh very stable and that's really good for life on earth because you wouldn't want to be living next to one of those ones that are a little bit more volatile but as we look at our sun now here you know it it, it doesn't vary that much we see some sunspots we see some flares we occasionally see a mass coronal ejection which is probably about the biggest burp our sun can do um and if it happens to be uh pointing towards earth then it can affect our satellites our communications our electrical systems and stuff like that um it was a big event um, in the last century uh, called the Carrington event. Uh, I think it was Carrington event, wasn't it? Um, where the telegraph wires picked up you know, lots of power. But our sun is going to live a long time. 
and it's going to be relatively stable until in the end it burns through all of that uh, fuel, that hydrogen fuel in the center and it will start oscillating and it will start growing and it may even grow to be the size out to Earth's orbit. I think the latest predictions are that it might not quite get there, but you certainly would get a bit sunburned uh, if you happen to be out on that particular day. We've got about four and a half billion years before all of this happens. But then our sun is going to end its life in what I think are, are some of the most extraordinary group of objects that we see in the nighttime telescopes, planetary nebulae. And I think they're extraordinary because their colors are so defined and rich and varied. Their shapes and apparent size in the telescopes vary tremendously. So we've got the Ring Nebula, that's probably the, 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 the most well-known, but we've got the Dumbbell Nebula, the Helix Nebula, we've got the Bug Nebula. Now, all of these things are from sun-like stars at the end of their life who kind of puff off their outer atmospheres. And some of them we see as a ring, like the Ring Nebula and the Dumbbell Nebula, but others like the Bug Nebula, the Ant Nebula, we see them as a, a sideways hourglass. But what we now know is that all we're seeing is the same kind of shape, but from two different orientations. So the Ring Nebula, oh, did you just see that bird fly across the sun then? Everybody see that? Phew. Got to keep your eyes on that live feed. I hope you snapped a picture of that. So the Ring Nebula, we're seeing that kind of hourglass from the end, so we're seeing it as a circle. But some of the other planetary nebulae we're seeing from the side. Um, but anyway, have a look at the life and death. Uh, it's, it's quite a long quest, uh, but you get a bundle of gravity points for it. But uh, I learned such a lot um, from, from doing that quest. Russ, have you had the chance to, to do that yet? Oh, I've just started it, but it okay. is fantastic. It's fantastic. It it's, and it's I, I, I think, I think all, I mean, the quests are, are, are excellent as an educational tool, you know, whether you are uh, attacking this uh, solo or whether you're working with a classroom, um, these quests are so valuable. They, they walk you step by step. They tell you what to do next, but they don't tell you everything and you have to so there's there's a really great uh amount of thinking that that goes into the quests uh from the uh person going through the quest um but there's also enough guidance that that you know you can tackle it with maybe you know even a young person can tackle it with with maybe some some minimal help um so i think that's what's wonderful about these um you know like a quest like the life and death of stars you know that's that's certainly aimed at our uh our you know our older audience, older high yep. school, college, um, you know, adult audience, but, um, so I'm allowed to do that. Am I as a, as a, as an old person? I, I was never, <laughs> I was never saying anything about anyone being old. I was, that was not my intention, <laughs> but yes, you can do yeah. that one. Um, Thank you very much. So, actually, yes, I, young, I, <laughs> young people are not allowed to do this one. So it, no. it, exactly. Yeah. We're, we're going to start putting an age limit on which question you can do. No, I guess you know, but I think that's that's one thing that's really interesting is that, you know, uh, a young kid, a young uh, middle schooler who's really motivated can still dig into that quest and get a lot out of it. Um, yeah. The quests really hit you wherever you are in your own uh, learning pr process, um, which I think is so amazing about them. Um, and the uh, the and, thing I uh, like about astronomy generally though, Russ, is you know, it's, um, sorry, I'm just going to snap an image of this because um, that's beautiful. Um, sorry, I get, I get diverted, don't I? Um, you know, astronomy education is it, it's, it's such a, a, a deep subject that everybody starts off at the same point. And what I found, certainly when I've mixed with other amateur astronomers, is a lot of us start from exactly the same level as some of your classrooms who are doing the online space camp do. You know, we're, we're still learning about those basics. We're learning about the celestial sphere and the way the sky changes over the seasons. And we're learning about different object types and different domains, the solar system, the Milky Way, deep space, you know, and that's what we're trying to piece together. We're trying to piece together this big narrative, this big story in our quest that will take people, you know, from 
the earth to the sun to the moon outward through the planets and in fact uh we're working on a quest at the moment which is all about celestial mechanics so anybody who's interested in uh kepler's laws and stuff like that planetary motion um that is going to be a really really cool quest i've got this one on sea feed variables that i'm doing we've also got uh russ this was one that um came from feedback from some of the teachers and students you're talking to we've got in the footsteps of galileo galilei uh where uh, we've set up a, a new object type. Uh, I don't know if everybody spotted that, but there's a new mission for the uh, Canary 3 deep sky system, which is called the Galilean satellites. And it's it's designed to give you the same kind of view uh, of the satellites and Jupiter um, as Galileo had through his telescope. And students in that quest are going to replicate what Galileo did, monitor the position of those moons over successive nights to work out their orbit and of course there's the huge story of you know how those observations basically overturned you know the earth-centric view of the universe that we had back then so uh, uh, but i do notice that cameron's in the house cameron McEwing. uh, uh hi cameron nice to see you cameron actually uh, did uh, one of our other quests that's been very popular the mystery of the island universes so uh cameron uh, how are you like the I'm back, well. backdrop New Zealand, what, what time is it down in New Zealand at the moment? About nine in the evening? Uh, seven in the evening, yeah. Seven in the evening. I, I knew it had to be one way or the other. So uh, we have got a real global um, reach tonight, haven't we? We've got India, we've got the USA, we've got the UK, Europe, um, we've got South America, we had Brazil, uh, we've got India. Um, any Anywhere, any countries I've missed there? Oh yeah, South Africa. Oh yeah, Carol, Carol waving frantically. Uh, well, oh, how could I? I'm, I, I'm ashamed. I'm ashamed, Carol. So I should be fired. Russ, have a word with boss. Uh, I, I no longer deserve to be here, having missed our most important person here, Carol Botha. Um, uh, hey, listen. Um, I think having mentioned Cameron and Carol, uh, Andrew, uh, just if you've got an update on feeds for us before we go to this next bit, anything happening? Okay, so the India URL still isn't working. I don't think that's going to come. Um, okay, we have got um, Malaysia coming online, but that looks cloudy at the moment. And that's a very partial, partial eclipse that they're getting there because yeah. they're a long way away from the line. And also the Dubai Astronomy Group are flipping to Taiwan every now and again. Um, okay. So, yeah, you can see the, the partial phase there as well. Okay, so I think, you know, the, the feed that we've had from Sharjah today has been... You know, although we didn't get annular there, it's been the most consistent. So hopefully everybody's been snapping loads of images from that. And we are about to see, why don't we, why don't we just kind of eke this out and, until the end of this? And then I'm going to call on Divya, who's going to tell us about the uh, SLU Ambassadors program. Because I've mentioned Carol, she's a SLU Ambassador, Andrew's a SLU Ambassador, Cameron's a SLU Ambassador, Divya herself is a SLU Ambassador. And I suspect there's a few more in the house. Um, that I, I haven't spotted yet, but let's just take a look at the end of this partial phase. So this is called um, fourth contact in a solar eclipse. Um, so the, the first contact is when the, the moon shadow first starts to eat into the sun, that's first contact. Second contact you get um, on annular and total phases when the remaining edge then hits the edge of the sun um, and then Third contact happens usually just minutes or seconds afterwards when the, the moon shadow starts to exit the sun. And then this is going to be fourth contact when the moon shadow totally leaves the solar disk. So think about that map that we had before and that large penumbral shadow that spanned hundreds and hundreds of miles. What's happening is where they are in Sharjah is that whole circular penumbral shadow is just about to leave the Middle East, which is why Malaysia is coming online because the front edge of that shadow is just hitting the far east and Malaysia, Taiwan and places like that. So this is always really difficult to tell when it's over. I can still see a chunk. Can you see a, a chunk still? I can just about see it. Actually, put your thumbs up if you can still see it and put your thumbs down when you think it's left. 
So this is a, a good test of eyesight at whatever time of day. It's late for some of you, it's early for others. I can still see, I'm sure I can still see it. Yes, 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 yes. Anybody gone thumbs down yet? Nobody's gone thumbs down that I can see yet. Oh, who's gonna break first? Who's gonna break first? It's not a competition, but it kind of is. Um, oh, oh. I, I think I've got to do that now. How's everybody else doing? Oh, Russ is still going. Yeah, uh, there's a few people still going. Diego's still there. Divya's still thumbs up. I can't see any. Oh, now Russ is gone. He's finally given way. Who's going to be the, the last person standing? Stan is there. Yari's there still. Uh, you're sitting there. Oh, Carol still thinks she can see a little chunk of it taken out. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, uh, wow. What I love about these views now is we know the moon is still there. But we just can't see it because we can't see its silhouette. Carol still reckons she can see a, a chunk taken out of that. I am going to defer to Carol because Carol is one of the best visual observers ever. She spent a long time um, learning her skills of observation, but Carol still reckons she can see. I can't see anything there, Carol. There's a, there's a slight difference in the... Oh, no, the, now she's the, gone. Yeah, the slew... The Zoom feed and the slew show feed. So Oh really? It's uh, so, yeah. So, so that it depends on which one you're looking at. Which one you're looking at. Okay. So that, that okay. was that was based on the people in the uh, in the webinar. So all the slew members um, are in yeah. the Zoom webinar. Yeah, go on, Carol. Hi. Um I have actually been watching it on a big wide screen. Oh right. I so, was beginning to think you had a bit of a smudge on your monitor. I was no, gonna no, say that no, you would no. get dust out. <laughs> I will be I will be posting the image. I look forward to seeing that. So that was a, that was a good one, wasn't it? So it looks like um, Dubai are going to go offline now because they have been up for quite a time. So here we are. We've got Taiwan. Taiwan. Um, you say tomato, I say tomato. Uh, quarter past three in the afternoon local time there. Um, you know, I'm surprised that a lot of the views that we've had today have been what are called white light views. Um, and a white light view uh, is a filter, which is like eclipse glasses, basically, um, that just filter out a lot of the, the sun's normal um, photosphere. Um, but I'm surprised we haven't seen more uh, feeds coming in using H-alpha, you know, like the SLU solar telescope, because those can give some terrific views, you know, of partial eclipses. Now, if anybody is watching in Taiwan or India where the eclipse is still taking place, there's an awful lot of stuff that happens during eclipse. When you're watching it yourself live in the sky with safe glasses and stuff like that, I've often said some of the best stuff in those partial phases actually happens behind you, not in front of you. So Divya, I don't know if you can see it, you can tell us uh, in, in a couple of minutes time, but anybody who's there, look behind you and look down at your own shadow. And what you'll notice is your own shadow is not as crisp as it usually is. You know, usually you get this really well-defined shadow, but also try and get close to a tree where you know all the leaves are casting a shadow down. And what you'll see is every single leaf shadow is in the form of a little arc. It's absolutely beautiful. If you can't get a tree, then use something artificial, um, a colander. You know, one of the, I don't know if everybody calls those the same thing, you know, a sieve, you know, for sieving vegetables, got lots of small kind of holes in a few millimeters wide. Get something like that, or there's some bats with holes in. Anything with a group of holes in, hold that up, look down at the shadow that's being cast and every single hole will be projecting a little crescent sun. It's the most, I think, one of the most extraordinary sights during the partial phases of an eclipse. But most people are so focused on looking at the sun that they miss all of that interesting stuff behind. You can also get on certain eclipses, eclipse bands, where you see on a white wall or something like this, these huge kind of interference uh, lines and bands, dark bands going down. So if you're lucky enough 
to be anywhere where you're seeing that partial eclipse at the moment, then look behind you every now and again, because there might be some interesting stuff going there. Um, Hal, you've got a hand up. Did you want to say anything? Uh, I'm not sure. No, he's good. Uh, Divya, we have talked several times. Oh, look at that. That's through the cloud. You can just see. You can just see there's uh, the moon shape on the right hand side. So a lot of people in the Far East and India are dealing with clouds at the moment. Divya, we've spoken about the SLU Ambassador program. Now you run uh, that program at SLU. Can you tell us, well, first of all, I want to hear, have you managed to see the eclipse at all um, in India? I don't know. I, th I think the whole of India certainly can see a partial eclipse, but I don't know if you're cloudy. But then could you tell us a little bit about what the SLU ambassadors are, what they do and how they can get involved, how anybody else can get involved? Uh, sure, Paul. And, um, you know, uh, unfortunately, I haven't stepped out to oh. witness the solar eclipse, but I enjoyed watching solar eclipse in uh, SLU, obviously. So I'm uh, glued up to the telescope page, actually. And, um, you know, so it's, it's very interesting. And that's why uh, SLU always like, you know, uh, the one that I depend on when such shows happens. I'll be always uh, having my eyes on the shows page in SLU. So, uh, you know, uh, so that, that's, that's very interesting. And I'm glad that I've taken a lot of pictures already. Good. And uh, regarding the Space Amb Ambassadors Program, yes. I think it's a wonderful initiative of 2020. And at this period of time, everybody is very dependent on social media. And um, I think uh, it's a great opportunity for everyone out there who are very interested in space exploration to have um, this kind of an, um, you know, volunteer positions to take up. So uh, SLU Space Ambassadors are uh, volunteers and SLU Frontline Representatives uh, wish to educate uh, the SLU members or the general public about the importance of uh, SLU space exploration, thereby building a community. Okay. So um, they are basically community leaders and uh, digital influencers, I would say, uh, of SLU working together from different parts of the country. There is, uh, you know, a great opportunity for all the representatives from all the countries. And um, guess what? We don't have age limits and. Uh, any any country or like you know anybody who just have interest in space passion in space and who are slow members can abs absolutely apply for um, becoming an ambassador and you actively want people from you know a, a large variety of regions and countries don't you yes um you know that's that that is what slow is for it's not restricted for any country it's for the world and I, I believe like, you know, uh, all countries of uh, space enthusiasts and, you know, astronomers, scientists, and, um, you know, uh, retired people, in fact, you know, who wants to constantly contribute uh, something for the space exploration and they can absolutely um, uh, take up this opportunity for being an ambassador. And, um, you know, if you wanted to join the program and join the club, you can, uh, you know, uh, drop me an email. Uh, divya at slu.com, D I V Y A at the rate slu.com. And uh, in, in fact, if you wanted to know more, you can uh, drop an email as well. So uh, you can see whether you will, you will be interested in joining us. And trust me, it's, it's just fun and um, it's just, you know, help, help us to learn a lot more and outreach about outreaching about the space is one best thing I've ever witnessed. Like, you know, it's just, keeps me inspired every day. Excellent. And you meet once a week, don't you, on a on a Zoom call. All the ambassadors get together and talk about what's happening in the community and you know things that you know things could be done better. So you feed back to the SLU development team, you know, on changes, you feed back on quests. And you know, it's such it's such a valuable group, you know, to to have a group of members like that who are very focused on one, of course, spreading the word about SLU. But secondly, the feedback that you're then able to give the team is, is something that we've never had before, you know, and we've been adapting, you know, so many things have changed even over the last few weeks based on the, the feedback, you know, from ambassadors, you know, Carol, uh, you know, we, we changed a, an awful lot of things, you know, based on some of the feedback that, that Carol gave the team. So, you know, I, I, I really, you know, it's, 
it's such an important program for us. So I wish it every strength. And anybody who is interested, then contact Divya, uh, who's managing that program, and you know, get involved. It's a good one. Thank you, Divya, for everything you're doing for us. Thank you. Uh, listen, anybody got any questions? Uh, and I'll, I'll, otherwise, I'll take you very briefly um, through the quest because uh, there's some there's some cool little things. Uh, we've already had 70 people start this quest. Uh, we've had six people finish it. A bit premature, I think. A bit premature. You didn't know if you were going to get that final image, did you? Uh, see, always wait because as soon as you press that claim badge button, you can't change the quest. So. Uh, shall I tell you a little bit about what we've done here? I told you right at the beginning, but I'll give you a better explanation now. This is just kind of pictorial um, uh, reference. So what these numbers on the quest do, each one of these is an image slot. So this is, in, in all of our quests, we have what's called the data collection step. And this is it. So in here, it's telling me I've uh, already loaded collected three of 41 images. But there's an important little thing here on this particular quest. It says there's a minimum of one needed. Now on most quests, you have to finish off all of the data collection before you can continue to the next slot, the, the next step. But this one, it's optional. And it's optional because what we've done is there are the 41 boxes. You can put whatever image you like, as long as it's from this particular, it's limited to any snaps that you've made um, during this event in any of those boxes. So these numbers, let's just say I want to put um, an image about three quarters of the way through the eclipse in image box number 19. I know where that's going to land up on my poster. So all I have to do is scroll down, go to box 19. There it is. And I can select maybe this one. Talk amongst yourselves while the little circle goes around. These are high def images, so uh, it's, it's pretty good on this poster. It's going to be pretty good. So it doesn't show up on here because this is just, you know, this is just a, a, a blank representation of the poster. But if we then go to the next step, we can see our poster and what it's looking like so far looking pretty cool if i say so myself given i've been doing this on the side as a kind of side thing today but i think that's looking pretty good but you can see what we're getting at you can lay this thing out in any way you like um now there's a little tip here um a coxie tip uh you, you know you can download the full resolution version of your poster at any time you don't have to finish you don't have to claim your badge before you download use that button to download the full definition one. And don't forget, we design these at incredibly high resolution so that they're suitable, that you can send them to a local print company and get them printed out, you know, three foot tall, uh, A1 size or, or even larger. Um, they're very high DPI dots per inch and high resolution. But did you know, if you just wanted one to share, you can right click and say, save image as, and that will, save you still a very good copy but a lower resolution version of your poster but i want to show you a little thing that i did yesterday so this is when i was putting this quest together um i was just putting together an example um of the kind of stuff that you can do so on the left you've got the quest poster as it appears in the quest so what i've done there this is from a previous um annular eclipse i've shown it in a circle around it and laid it out. Now, if you printed out the poster, that is what it would look like. You'd have all of those empty holes. We're gonna change that in the future because we've only just come up with this idea. So we're gonna change that in the future that they would go black. But the version on the right is what took me literally five minutes. I just opened my downloaded poster in some image processing software I used a magic wand selection tool to select all of this blue stuff and turned it all black. And then you learn up with a beautiful illustration like that in a lovely circle showing the progression of the eclipse. So I'm interested to see what other members are going to do with this. You know, I, I quite fancy a, um, 
a spiral version. So coming along from the top, then down, then down, then up, and then a smaller circle around and around, then you'd finish up, where would you finish here? And then you'd go to your favorite image in the middle. Now, I don't know if anybody managed to capture it. Um, any of those annular clips, they were quite small. And I'm not sure if they were in the camera to snap, but even so the progression that we've had from the uh, Sharjah feed today is going to make a pretty cool poster, I think. Andrew, has, can you let me know if, um, has, has that feed been very consistent throughout the entire eclipse? The Sharjah one? Yeah. Yes, it has, yes. Yeah. Right, so so everybody should have been able to collect a really nice progression of, of images there. Now, I think there were um, a, a few before we came on air. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll grab those and make those available uh, to members. Now, unfortunately, only astronomer members can upload images. But if you upload an image um, for a quest, and we've had this quite a bit on the collection quests, um, if you upload an image, you can select a SLU 1000 object to associate that uploaded image to, and then it will appear in your quest as being available in the quest. But um, I don't know, uh, is, is, that, is that kind of poster thing and giving you the kind of option to lay things out yourself? Is that a, a thumbs up, a thumbs down? Is, is it something you want to see more of? Yeah, I, I, I think from, from my point of view, it, it means that you can put your own character on it. You can almost design you know, the layout of your own post. And don't forget, you can do some post editing, download it, and you can edit it, change the text, whatever you like. So anyway, right, uh, where are we? Um, let's take a look at the live feeds. Oh, look, um, the charge is still going. I think they are. Eclipse finished for them. Probably, uh, what was that, 20 minutes ago, 25 minutes ago, something like that. Uh, so Dubai Astronomy Group, uh, that looks like Japan to me, um, looking a bit muddy, I would say, their skies. Either somebody smeared the telescope lens or it's quite cloudy, one of the two. Um, that's not one to uh, snap. So, so we haven't had, we haven't had our India feed because in Sursa, um, in fact, uh, you know, that was a feed that we were really relying on there, but they have had a lot of cloud there, which is not, I don't think, uncommon for this time of year. Um, but we've also seen, we've, so we've had great feeds at the moment. We did have them from the International Astronomy Center right at the beginning as well. They're in Abu Dhabi. Um, they've done us some great feeds for some of the lunar eclipses that we've done. Um, but the Sharjah Academic, uh, Academy of Astronomy, Space Science and Technology at the University of Sharjah, They've really given us that terrific feed um, all the way through, which is quite cool. Malaysia, Andrew, you said that we did have Malaysia online as well at one point, did we? Yeah, I've swapped the feed from IAC and um, SAS uh, and taken those off. Uh, and Malaysia is now on Malaysia tab. Well, let's hop over and take a quick look. Uh, so shows page, there we go. Right, so which one am I going for? Okay, um, fourth one, Malaysia. <gasps> Ooh, pretty. Grab one of those. It's not cropped very well, but <laughs> it's not. <laughs> it's there. It's there. It's still seeing. So here we can see. So if I um, if I pull that back up again, actually. Um, so Malaysia, if your geography is as bad as mine. Uh, Malaysia is down here um, in the Far East, and you can see that they are they're right off to the edge of the penumbral eclipse. So the penumbral shadow is everything that's in blue there. In fact, we've got this, um, in fact, I think the better way of showing this is actually, so all of this is actually in the quest. Um, so you can have a good reminder about this later on. Um, but this is going to be the easiest way of me showing it to you. We'll take a look at that animation because it, it kind of might make sense now. Now that we've seen you know, what happened in the feeds from the Middle East, what happened in the feeds uh, that we saw in India at one point and, um, and Taiwan, and now Malaysia, 
So there was our little diagram explaining the three types of shadow that the moons cast. And the moon casts these shadows all the time, with the exception of there's one moment, there's one event where the moon does not cast those shadows. I'll leave you to think about that. Um, I can hear the, 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 the cogs turning. Um, but it's only when the Earth passes into those shadows that we actually see an eclipse. Now, every single object in the solar system casts shadows like this. They cast an umbra and penumbral shadow, um, and in fact, an antumbra. Um, but they can get a, a lot smaller. So if you can imagine, we saw um, eclipse of Mercury um, recently. Now, that is the same kind of thing. It's like an annular eclipse. It's just the annulus is really, really big. And Mercury is a tiny, tiny little dot. But basically, we're in the Ant Umbra shadow of Mercury when we're doing that. It's just incredibly large and incredibly diffuse. Um, but all objects cast this. We see it on Jupiter. So Jupiter casts a shadow. And what we can see when we look at the live um, feeds of Jupiter is we get eclipse events. So there's all sorts of events that you can get with the four largest moons of, of Jupiter. So you can get a transit when the actual moon, we see it move across the face of the planet. We can see a shadow transit which is where the shadow cast by the moon is falling on Jupiter's surface and going across. Before opposition, the shadow goes in front of the moon. After opposition, it's around the other way because the sun's coming from the other way. But behind what we see is an occultation. So an occultation is when one of the moons goes behind the actual planet's disk, disappears in view. But we also get eclipses of those moons when the moons pass into the shadow cast by Jupiter. Now, the only time you don't see those is at opposition when the sunlight is hitting Jupiter direct and occultation and eclipse actually occurs roughly the same time. So anyway, all, um, all objects cast these shadows. Earth, of course, casts an umbral and penumbral shadow. That's why we get a penumbral lunar eclipse. It's when we get a full eclipse, uh, a total eclipse of the moon uh, is the umbral shadow but this is what I wanted to just hop down to, this uh, animation once again. So there we go. So just a reminder, that big gray circle, that's the moon's penumbral shadow um, crossing the planet of the Earth as we've seen over the last couple of hours. And if you look carefully on this, let's, um, can we do that? If you look carefully on this, you can see that little dot. That is the ant umbral shadow. And it's rare that those these three things coincide and the distance from the moon to the earth is just right so that that antumbral shadow is the thing that touches Earth's surface. And that's what gives us the uh, annular eclipse. So what we can see is earlier on, uh, so when it starts again, we'll see the front edge of the penumbral shadow hit the Middle East. So bang, there it is, that's what we saw. And then the eclipse gets greater and greater and greater until we saw those five views when they were at greatest eclipse. There was that one from Oman um, that did have an annual eclipse, but we'll wait for it to come around again. And so they had uh, their annual eclipse in India, but here we go, bang. There we see just the bottom edge of that penumbral shadow reaching the far east. So if we then go back, um, to the feed, sorry, loads of, loads of screens, go back to here. I can't keep everything open at the same time, otherwise it, um, and, and there we can see the result of that, right? So this is, um, I suspect they've already gone through their greatest eclipse, but you can see the greatest eclipse here was really shallow in comparison to what we saw in the Middle East, which had, what did I say, was it, it was over 80% obscured, wasn't it? I think 89% um, for some of those, um, because they were closer to that central path. So, oh, that's nice. I'll snap one of those. Thank you very much, Andrew. So, uh, right, we are, I think, winding up now, because, um, you know, that's uh, the, the, the moon's 
uh, shadow is going to kind of carry on moving off uh, in Malaysia. But have we got any questions either about the eclipse or about SLU or, I don't know, the, the price of fish? Anybody got any questions? Don't leave me hanging. You leave me hanging. It's embarrassing. It's embarrassing. Oh, I have a question for you. Yay! What's the next big event that we should be looking out for? Uh, next big event looking out for. Thanks for the notice on that one, Todd. Um, Todd, by the way, is uh, SLU's uh, chief kind of engineer. What's your title, Todd? I never know what it is. It's chief engineer. Uh, VP of engineering. <laughs> VP, vice president, engineer. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Next big event. Well, there is a. What happens with um, eclipses is they come in pairs. This one, I think, has come in threes. Um, and so you land up getting uh, a lunar eclipse two weeks away um, from a solar eclipse. And the, the way the geometry has worked out on this one, and I, somebody correct me, somebody put a really nasty face at me, kind of growl at me if I get this wrong. But we did have a penumbral ecl lunar eclipse two weeks ago. But I think unusually there's a penumbral lunar eclipse in two weeks time as well. So there's actually a lunar eclipse on either side of this solar eclipse. I am not seeing any growling faces. Um, so let's go ahead with that. Uh, later on in the year, eclipse wise, I think it's December 14th, maybe, we have a total solar eclipse. Now, this one uh, is very, very similar. The eclipses this year are kind of a duplicate of what we saw last year, strangely. So the path of this annular eclipse has been very similar to the one that we saw um, last year. Um, and also, the, the, it's another, the total eclipse in uh, December is another South American eclipse, which is going to be great for us because it's fairly close to the observatory. Uh, I know Daniela. Uh, has been in the webinar. Hi, Daniela, if you can see us. Um, she's our, she's the um, astronomer, the resident astronomer at our observatory in Chile. Um, and uh, hopefully she'll be able to provide us with some great live feeds of the total solar eclipse down there. But we've also got one uh, which I'm really excited about because I don't recall seeing one of these uh, before. So if we go to the shows tab, let's just have a look at what's coming up. Uh, now, as Mike Shaw's Nightscape, of course, big event. That's a big one. But this is the one. We have got shows in between this, but we haven't announced them yet. But this is one of the ones that I'm looking forward to most of all. This is the Great Conjunction. Now, a Great Conjunction happens, I think it's every 19 years, maybe, something like that. And a Great Conjunction is when the two largest planets in our solar system come together in the night sky, and it's Jupiter and Saturn. And they get so close together in the night sky that you know normally these conjunctions are visual things. You know, you go outside at dawn or dusk and you see two bright objects close to each other. Jupiter and Saturn are going to be so close together that they're going to fit within our telescope fields of view. So in a single image, we're going to be able to see Jupiter and Saturn. And if we track them over a period of time, we'll actually see their different rates of motion because Jupiter normally travels faster than Saturn because Jupiter's closer to Earth and stuff like that. So I'm really looking forward to that because it's going to be an absolute visual feast to look at outside with a pair of binoculars or even a small telescope or just the naked eye. Uh, but through the SLU telescopes, I'm really looking forward to seeing how that one turns out. See those two mighty planets, two of my favorite objects actually in the night sky, you know, in the same telescope field of view. I will be snapping like mad during during that little event. So uh, anything else, anybody? God. Thank you, Paul. That's right, Todd, any time. Thank you so much for managing the, the Zoom uh, stuff tonight. So it would have been impossible for me to do that as well as everything else. So. Well, anything I have to uh, thank Emmanuel from our team as well. Oh yeah, uh, yeah, thank the... you very much, Emmanuel. So, let's take hey, a look, hey. I'm just gonna, Flop over hey, Paul, I, yes, I want to mention one just one more time, you know, if if anybody out there is is interested in discussing SLU for their classroom, um, you know, drop me a note, russ at slu.com. So love to uh, talk to you about that, how that might work for your classroom. And, you know, we really can work with anyone 
from elementary, middle school, high school, and uh, and beyond. So college, our higher ed um, uh, education is really going really well. So check us out. Give me. Yeah, a and uh, we've got you know uh, building a, a really strong quest creation team now. So we've got John Boyce Burt, Boyce Burt, um, and also Dr. Mike Shaw as well. Um, he is on our quest creation team now, and. Uh, he showed me the outline of his first quest the other day, and I think you're going to enjoy that. And we've got plenty more planned for high school and um, and for college students. Um, and, I, and I'll tell you, you know, SLU members, you know, normal SLU members, we're all kind of normal SLU members, but you're going to enjoy all of them. You know, and we were talking earlier, weren't we, about, you know, kind of learning progression and getting into astronomy and learning, you know, what we're doing at the moment is we're getting a large variety of quests out there. Some, which will take you a long time, you know, like the Messier and Caldwell collection quests where you're collecting, what is it in total, 219 objects. Um, you know, it'll take you a, 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 at least six months, probably nine months or a year to collect those if you're making sure that you collect the very best images. But then you've got the one-nighters, you know, quests that you can do in a single day or a single night. So we've got a broad range at the moment, but what you'll slowly start to spot over the coming months is how they all form this lovely learning progression that'll take you right from the basics of Cosmic Explorer, where it just introduces you to, this is the variety of objects you can see in the SLU telescopes, you know, without going into very much depth. But then we've got things like John's recent, you know, life and death of stars. Uh, we've got uh, the, the, quest that Mike Shaw is working on at the moment is about star clusters. So you're going to go on an adventure to really understand and see the differences between open star clusters and globular star clusters and talking about star color and what that can tell you about their size and, 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 and mass and age. Um, we've got a whole series of in the footsteps uh, quests where you can replicate, you know, discoveries down the ages. Those are the ones that I'm working on in the collection quests as well. Andrew, by the way, over there is uh, helping out with a huge, a lot of the posters that you see for the quest. You know, Andrew is, is doing all the legwork with that and laying out these grids and, you know, that lovely, lovely diagram that you adapted for, for this one. Um, so anyway, you know, so we've got lots, we got lots planned there, Russ. So I, I think lots of exciting stuff ahead as far as quests are concerned. Anybody else? Any, anybody got anything? I have a question. Yes, uh, how, Where do we have uh, get access to the school uh, time lapse animation tool? Uh, it's only included in the quest, so it's not available outside of quest at the moment, Bonnie, but um, we are uh, we are considering um, making it available outside the quest, but if if there's something specific that you want to use it for, then let me know. Because if anybody's got any ideas for quests uh, that you'd really like to try out, then let me know. Email me, paul at slew.com, um, and we'll put something together, Bonnie. But it will hopefully be available as a kind of separate tool outside of a quest at some point in the future, but not at the moment. So, uh, anybody else? Anybody else? Carol, Carol you did have your hand. Oh, Divya, go on. Carol got a question. I just yeah. seeing her. Hey, Carol. Hi. Uh, may I introduce myself, Paul? Of course you can. Okay, I'm Carol Werther from South Africa. I'm a member of an amateur astro group, the Orion Observation Group. And I've been a SLU member since 2017. And it's been an amazing experience. I'm doing some super astronomy. And I'm looking forward to more South Africans joining me on my adventures on SLU. But here is my question. Quest. What happens once we press that claim your badge button? Do the slew top brass sit and giggle about our answers? <laughs> I'm, I was just wondering because um, I don't think any of us can really say we know it all or that we remember it all, and especially uh, Russ as a senior member <laughs> i don't mean, mind being called a senior and i'll be your cook anytime <laughs> um we just don't remember stuff and then oh i hate it when that little button goes incorrect oh <gasps> i know it's like 
so so that's my question what happens do you do you do you we we don't we don't um we don't go in there and uh for, for, in, for individual members and see how many times you've got that question incorrect carol no uh you'll well, be pleased to hear otherwise my reputation what? the little reputation that i have would be in absolute ruins uh if that was the case uh but we have what seen a, a few relief absolutely it's a so. relief <laughs> yeah we, we did we did consider at one point um no, no, you know no, kind no. of almost freezing a quest if you got a question wrong but actually oh. going through and if you don't know the answer and the answer is normally in the quest and if it's not in the quest it's in a guide so it's usually on the slew website where you can find the answer so some people we know just click through uh because they just want to go through the quest and get some gravity points but the majority of us are doing this to learn stuff. And actually by showing you the other questions that are incorrect, by finally getting to the correct um, answer, you learn something through that process. Um, but one of the things that we are considering in the future, and this is really important, and, and in fact, all of, all of the answers, um, all of the posters, everything is recorded in uh, the database because this is gonna be very important uh, for teachers to be able to go into their classroom, their students' activities to see how they did. They're basically going to, you know, press a button to say, here we go, I'm submitting my my project to you, my, my quest results to you. So the teacher will be able to see that. Um, but, you know, you can always go through and, you know, review the answers that you gave and have a look at your poster again and stuff like that. What I would stress is, you know, uh, and you'll see this in a lot of the quests that I've, I've written recently, I, I'm trying to drum home, challenge yourself on this. This is not about just getting some gravity points or claiming your badge. It's about learning something. For those collection quests, you know, let's just have a look at, um, in fact, there was a, oh, I know, I could show you, um, Oh, no, I can't show you that one. Um, I was uh, the, the Messier collection quest. You can go through that and you can pick any old image taken with any of the telescopes. So you could maybe use a ring nebula, uh, you know, for M57 using one of the ultra wide field telescopes where the planetary nebula is so tiny in the image you can't see it. Who are you doing it for? You're doing it for you. So surely you want the best possible poster to come out at the end of it, to share that and be proud of, rather than just using any old image. So challenge yourself all the way through with these things. Um, and it's something that I'm doing with some of those advanced quests, you know, which are teaching me a lot, that life and death of stars quest, taught me a huge amount. And I actually specifically didn't claim my badge, even though I'd finished it, because I wanted to get some better images of some of the, the stars that I'd captured in there. Um, you know, so, uh, it, it, it's a it's a good question, but yeah, you're in your own little bubble at the moment, Carol. So nobody else is kind of looking over your shoulder. But yeah, I I, I feel um, this is actually important because when you think back at your school days and college days or whatever, and you had to have tests, you were being judged. Yeah, you're not being judged. You're being tested on how much of your knowledge you still remember and know and how much you actually have to brush up on. And um, in the chat, everybody knows I struggled and everybody will see I struggled with the proton proton chain thing. Yeah, I did. Because so many, I've listened to so many lectures and so many people have um, told me how it works and everything. And then suddenly when the, when the question is, when you jumped upon with this question, you just think you know the answer and you press the button and it's wrong. It's yeah. incorrect. I know. And then you think, okay, no, then it's got to be the next one. Incorrect. So, <laughs> so oh. I'm, I'm telling you, I am doing so much homework <laughs> and I'm enjoying the life and death of stars quest so yeah. much. I'm reading each, if you read each sentence, I read about, um, say 10 sentences and then I go and have a break or go for a walk or something because it's heavy stuff in there if you're really interested yeah. in learning it is. more. Thank it you is. very and, much. Yeah, and I find when, I, when I've when i gone back through it as well, 
um, when I've finished it, you know, that's that's been incredibly useful because it's, you know, it's a bit like, you know, going back to that diagram of the uh, uh, eclipse tonight, you know, once you've been through it, we've seen all those live feeds and that diagram of what we were seeing with the, the moon shadow going across the earth kind of starts to make more sense. But this is what I'm talking about with making the most of it. So what I've done here is as an astronomer member, I'm able to upload images. So I took some of the images I processed, I cropped, you can see my ring nebula um, image there. I've cropped it to make it larger, uploaded it. It's then available for my quest. I made sure that I got a whole solar disk in for the sun and the very best images I could. And then you can see I've even labeled the stars you know, that I put in there. So this is after the quest, I've downloaded the post and added more information to it because I'm proud of this. You know, this is for me, it's not for anybody else. I, I want to, I enjoyed the exercise. So I'm, I'm totally with you there, Carol. So uh, listen, folks, we ought to, um, let's just take a very quick look um, at the Dubai Astronomy Group who are still getting images in from Japan or it looks like Japan, doesn't it? Um, I apologize profusely for my total lack of knowledge of foreign languages and writing. Uh, but that looks pretty miserable to me. That's about halfway though, isn't it? I would say. So that, they're probably at maximum eclipse there. Um, so probably, what would you say? 30%, 40% obscured. And um, listen, unless anybody has got any last questions. Oh yeah, I've just seen, sorry, the, I've just seen the big words at the top of the feed eclipse from Japan. Yeah, I was actually looking at the feed and looking at the writing thinking, where's that from? But anyway, sorry, stupid moment there. Time for more coffee. Uh, unless anybody's got any questions, I think we should call oh, it I a, had one. a night. Yes, yes. Oh, hi, Jerry. Jerry. Hel hello, Jerry. Yes, I'm Jerry Bachmann from Finland. Love your, love the images that you process on Slew and Share. Thank you very much for those. I yeah. always brighten my coffee in the morning. Okay, <laughs> nice to hear. Nice to hear. I just wanted to get back on the Messier uh, yes. challenge. And uh, uh, if you look very carefully, so above my head on on the wall back, yeah. you can see my... Oh, I can. My, Excellent. My poster of the of the Messier challenge and... Brilliant. Nice just wanted to Just wanted to say that that I've been so happy this last year with Sleuth because it's it's uh, really finally broke up or broke out my my misery that that I didn't have time for astronomy and now I, as I have retired so now I have the time. Excellent. So well, it's listen. Been, Yari, you're, you're such a superb example of, of, a, of a SLU member because you share your expertise when it comes to image processing. You share your glorious, glorious images uh, all the time. I kind of always, well, going to uh, observations, shared observations is one of the first things I do in the morning when I spark up my machine and I go through all of those. And I find that Yari, uh, David, um, there's a couple of others there that I, I've forgotten to mention. But I hover on their observations longer than anybody else and I open them up so I can view them full screen. And I do what Carol's been, you know, prompting so many of us to do. Don't just look at it as a beautiful image, observe the image, try and work out what's going on in it. You know, is it a reflection nebula? Is it a dark nebula? What are the physical properties that are going on there? Start having a look at some of the spiral galaxies. Can you see nebulae in the spiral galaxy? arms and things like this you know what detail can you see in jupiter tonight that you couldn't see last night you know it's it's the art of observation as as carol puts it and it's something i think all of us at slu can do look beyond sometimes the pretty picture and just think to ourselves what's going on there you know so maybe that that's added that's added quite an interest for me in my use of slu and especially seeing all of those images that members share so anyway uh, anything else? Anybody? Uh, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. That's it. We are finished. It's time for a full English breakfast and a large jug of coffee. Thank you so much for staying up late. If you're in the States, it's really, really late for you guys. Um, 
India, you're going to be having your afternoon tea any minute. I think Cameron is uh, just about to have his breakfast. I'm going to have, no, you're about to have your dinner, um, a late dinner. I'm about to have my late breakfast, go and feed the dog. Thankfully, he hasn't been moaning during this. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you most of all for everybody who has put their head above the parapet, unmuted themselves and ask some questions because that's what we want these star parties to be. You lot talking to us and a big discussion, you know, around the campfire rather than just listening to me with a presentation and a bit of information here and there. So you know. thank you very much, Andrew, for managing all of the feeds tonight. Thank you, Russ, for telling us about uh, SLU, SLU's online space camp and educational program. Thank you very much, Divya, for telling us about the SLU Ambassador Club. Thank you very much, Todd and Emmanuel uh, on the east coast of the USA, you know, dealing with managing the Zoom webinar and stuff like that. We will see you next week. Mike Shaw's got a star party Tuesday, I believe. I think that's on. Uh, so we'll see you over there. Otherwise, we'll see you in the clubs, in chat, anywhere else. Share your best images. And if you do make a nice, cool poster in the uh, of the eclipse, then uh, do share that as well. Don't be afraid to share your quest posters so that's all from me uh russ andrew todd divya cameron milton everybody else here thank you so much for joining us and thanks for sticking out for the entire event bye for now